Okay, uh, welcome everyone to AZ Smug Q4 uh, user group meeting, last meeting of the year. Um, glad to see everybody today. I see a lot of return faces, so that's always good. And uh, we'll try to set something up for Q1, um, probably in the February time frame. So stay tuned. We got some announcements to make towards the end of the meeting. Um, my name is Mike Terrell. If you guys have met me, I uh, run the user group. Um, always open to corresponding, things like that. You can find me on Twitter mostly. Um, but with that, today uh, we have a couple of speakers. We've got Michael Niehaus from Microsoft, who probably doesn't need any introductions. Uh, he's going to talk to us about Autopilot. Then we got Patch My PC as our sponsor today. And um, they were out here, I think in 2019, um, at a user group meeting we had at the Wells Fargo location. Um, if any of you deal with patching, um, definitely want to check them out. And uh, they're going to go through some deep dives on some of their stuff for like third party stuff as well. Um, and then lastly, we have Andrew. I think Andrew takes the top speaking slot for user group members. Uh, he's always volunteering. I think last time he would have, but he I was dying. had to have a <laughs> emergency surgery. So uh, um, but anybody else that wants to, to speak, definitely, we want to hear from you guys. Um, it does a couple things. Um, we're all kind of doing the same thing. Um, and it might give somebody a different way to look at something or try something or do something else. The other thing it does is it helps you with your presentation skills. So if you need to do any presenting at work, um, it will help you in your career. So getting up. Yeah, people might get a little bit nervous, things like that. Um, but it's a good spot to, to just get up and, and talk and present and just become more comfortable. Because when you're more comfortable, you're more confident. And that will help build some good career skills that are not technical re related, but it will help you in your career. So um, we do have, I think, 10 and 15 minute gaps between speakers. Um, so just Take those as breaks if you need them. Uh, the restrooms are past the elevators to, to the left. Um, and then later, I think we might have a guest appearance from Mr. Wally Meat. Uh, he was at MMS Jazz Edition, which is what Andrew's going to be recapping because he was a luck, lucky winner for that. So uh, we'll get to hear all about it. And, and then um, lastly, we'll have a social that. Patch my PC sponsoring at Local Patron. We've been doing that the past couple meetings. It's been kind of nice just gathering, talking, get to know each other, uh, bringing people out of their shell. <laughs> so um, with that, uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Niehaus. All right. Here we go. PowerPoint slide. So how many of you were at Ignite? Nobody. <laughs> That's got to be a first. Uh, it was an, an interesting event, at least. They keep tweaking it every year. And this year's tweak was, let's make every session 45 minutes long. Almost every session. There were a few that were longer than that. So. We went from typically talking for an hour and 15 minutes, and with Autopilot, we typically had two sessions at Ignite to one 45-minute session this year. So I took what was basically the standard set of Autopilot content and squished it into 45 minutes. So I have an hour here. I can talk. <laughs> the main thing that we wanted to cover at Ignite, and we'll cover here as well, is Roadmap. What's, what we're working on, what we're changing, where we want to go, what we think our problems are still with autopilot. So we'll touch on all of those. There are a few things that I've added into here that are new since Ignite, really just more detail beyond what we had shared at Ignite. So we'll go through that as well. But uh, how many of you know autopilot? No. Okay, that's a little better. Uh, Positioning wise, Autopilot is designed to take us from traditional imaging. Mike's the skeptic, I, I know, but the goal is to go from having to maintain images and drivers and task sequences and 
deploying all this stuff to every new PC that comes into, into your organization to instead use a process that's less costly and time consuming, where you can take what shipped on the PC and transform it into something that's ready for productive use. So the OEM worries about the image of the drivers, you don't. You just worry about how do I transform that? Now that could be driven by Intune, it could be driven by Config Manager, it doesn't really matter from our perspective. We just wanna make the autopilot process bootstrap the device to join it into Active Directory or Azure AD to get it enrolled in Intune, potentially co-manage Config Manager so that you can lay down the configuration on the device. What we really want to see uh, in the long term is to make it as easy as setting up a new phone. You get a new phone, you get it out of the box, you turn it on, it asks you, hey, would you like to restore your settings from your old phone? <coughs> yeah, sure. So it reinstalls all your apps and everything is ready to go maybe within an hour or two. We're not quite to that vision yet. We can do a pretty good job of automating the configuration of a device. So taking it from that base OEM state, layering everything else on top of it. It's that extra non-mandatory stuff that gets to be a little bit more interesting. If you can configure the rules in Intune or Config Manager to push it, great. But like if the user did company portal or software center to install a whole bunch of additional apps on their old PC, today they're still gonna have to redo that on their new PC to get that stuff back. That's just waste of time. We want to get away from that and automate as much of that as possible. So we'll get there, but we're not at 100% yet. From a requirements perspective, we do build on top of Azure Active Directory. We leverage auto enrollment and company branding, and dynamic groups, things like that. We leverage Intune. The device will always enroll in Intune first, even if you're intending for all the workloads to be managed by Config Manager via co-management. But those are the main licensing requirements. You get those in place and you're, you're ready to go. From a process perspective then, we need to register devices with Autopilot to say they belong to your organization. We assign a profile of settings to those devices to say what scenario do you want to do. Is it Active Directory, Azure Active Directory, user-driven, uh, self-deploying, uh, all of those scenarios you indicate in the autopilot profile. Once that's assigned to the device, then you can deploy. The registration ideally is done when you order the devices. So you tell the OEM or the reseller that you're buying the devices from, here's my tenant details, please register these devices for me. They will ask you for permission in order to do that. Uh, your Azure AD tenant admin has to approve that. Once they've approved that, then they can add devices on your behalf. You then need to make sure that those devices end up in a group so that you can assign a profile to. The easiest way of doing that, we tag the devices with group tags, which are just arbitrary text strings, or the purchase order ID. You can use those as attributes to build dynamic groups in Azure AD to automatically select those devices. If you then assign a profile to that dynamic group, Intune takes care of the rest. We've just added the ability to edit those group tags. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but it used to be a bit of a pain because you might have this grand plan as to how you want to group these devices. And the OEM would say, well, great. We'll set up as many group tags as you want, as long as it's one, two if you're Lenovo. Uh, like Dell did one, Lenovo said that they would support two. So uh, if you started to get more creative with these group tags, just didn't work because the OEM wouldn't do it for you. But I think we've got that covered now if you are willing to do a little bit of editing. That's kind of the scale approach. When you're ready to go broad, you let the OEM or reseller register the devices for you. But if you are testing this out initially, you're going to take an existing device and try this out. In order to register those, you have to run a PowerShell script in Windows 10 to collect the hardware hash from the machine. And then you can upload that to Intune. If you're doing that for thousands of devices, you're not doing something right. Uh, there are plenty of ways to automate that process. Ideally, at purchase time, 
but you can also just enroll all the devices in Intune and be a co-management and tell Intune to import them all. So there are other ways to go about it. PowerShell approach is the last resort. For the profile assignment, you create the profile in Intune, you assign it to an Azure AD group. Every device that ends up in that group gets the profile assigned automatically. If those groups are dynamic, then this is kind of a self-maintaining system. New device gets added to autopilot, shows up in the group, gets the profile ready to deploy. If that is, if the registration is done by the OEM, all the rest of that stuff can happen even before you've received the box. It'll have a device in Azure AD, it'll be in the group, it'll have the profile assigned, and it's still on a FedEx truck somewhere. So definitely good to get that registered in advance. At that point, we're ready to deploy. The device will boot up, be connected to a network. It checks in with the autopilot deployment service to say, here's my hash, do you know about me? The autopilot service will re respond back to say, yes, here's the autopilot profile that's been configured, and that'll control the deployment from that point forward. We've been working with as many OEMs and resellers as we can, just to make sure that they all understand and can implement this process. Pretty much all the major OEMs are already doing this, so we're good there. Uh, now we're working on the next layers in the system, the distributors and the resellers, because they, it's a complex ecosystem, so they don't always have all of the information about the devices that they're selling. So it gets to be interesting if CDW is told to register the devices on your behalf. In order for them to do that, they might need details about the device that they just don't have because the OEM hasn't provided that to them. There are ways around that, but uh, we are working on trying to simplify that. If we look at the capabilities that the OEMs and resellers provide, all of them can do device registration. So you tell them, here are my tenant details, register these devices. All of them can do clean images. Now, whether they do it for free or not depends. In the case of Surface and Lenovo, they always ship with clean images on their commercial devices. No extra stuff, just windows and drivers. In the case of Dell, you have to pay $30 per device as their list price for getting a clean image on the device. Now, they do give you, as part of that $30 charge, the ability to choose what version of Windows you want on there. So there is some additional benefit from that cost beyond just the clean device. Lenovo will offer you a choice of versions as well. In their case, they charge, it's not 30, it seems like it was like $18 or something like that to get a different version of Windows than the default one that it would have shipped with. So if Lenovo were to move their devices to 1909 and you say you still want a device to ship with 1809, they'd say, sure, no problem. They can do that for a cost. Lenovo and probably others would also let you add things into that default factory image. Like you could give them install files for apps and they would pre-install those apps in the device before it ships. Intune could do it just as well. So that's more of a time optimization. So if you wanted to get those apps pre-installed because you didn't want to wait when the device finally showed up, you could do that as well. What they're now working on is something we'll talk about in a little bit more detail, white glove services to let you pre-provision the device before you give it to the end user. Right now, you would give the end user an unconfigured device and tell them to type in their credentials and wait. Might take 15 minutes, might take two hours. If they're on the slow network, it might take four hours, who knows? So with the pre-provisioning process, the OEM, IT, someone could do pre-provisioning of the device before the user ever gets it, so that the user just has to wait five minutes to finish the process up. We expect a lot of uh, OEMs and resellers will, will offer that as a service so that you just pay them and they'll take care of it for you. It then becomes a question of, one, do I need that service or can the end user just suck it up and wait? Two, uh, can you do it more cheaply than the OEM or partner can do? Maybe, depends on your scale. If you're gonna do five machines a day and this OEM is gonna do 5,000 machines per day, 
odds are they can do it more efficiently than you can. But it's those types of uh, considerations that go into that. But it does vary by OEM, re reseller, distributor. So definitely talk to them and ask them, what can you do as far as autopilot goes? What services do you provide? To help out with the registration, like for a partner to register the device, they need the manufacturer model serial number of the device. They can also do it using the serial number and the Windows product key ID. They could also register the device with the full hardware hash. Getting the hardware hash requires booting up into Windows, running a PowerShell script. That's a pain. They don't want to do that because it requires getting the device out of the box and booting it up and not screwing it up before they shut it back down again and put it in the box and send it to you. So they don't like doing that. So we said, well, we can incent the OEMs to put another barcode on the box with the Windows product key ID on it. So then they can just scan the box to get the necessary details to register the machine. So we hope that this will help out the resellers who can't get the full details from the OEM. Now, it might seem that manufacturer model serial number isn't too hard, but you haven't seen HP devices. Oh, gosh, is it HP or HP Inc or Hewlett Packard or Hewlett Packard Inc? Is it lowercase, uppercase, periods, commas? It's a nightmare to come up with the right values to register the device without opening up at least one and checking to see what values there are on that one device. You can probably come up with the serial numbers pretty easily from the box. It's that manufacturer and model that gets messy. It's also messy on Lenovo's because Lenovo uses a four character model and then a four character configuration on, on that model. So every new configuration you order gets a different eight character string. Nastiness. So this is easier. It just requires serial number and this. It's only numeric, so you don't have to worry about upper, lowercase, punctuation, anything like that. So a new option, but we did have to uh, offer the OEMs money to do this. We basically said, for every device you ship that ends up being deployed by autopilot, we'll pay you a certain amount of money to, to recover the cost of you putting this extra barcode on your box. They'll do anything for money, so <laughs> done. All right, then in autopilot, we have a variety of scenarios that we implemented, starting in Windows 10 1703 with the basic Azure Active Directory join scenario. We join the devices to the cloud and roll them in into. We then added in 1809 hybrid Azure AD join support, so we could join the device to an on-prem Active Directory domain. We had actually shipped uh, self-deploying mode in 1809 as well to do a basically an automated deployment to the machine. No credentials, no ID and password. You just boot up the machine, it deploys itself. We shipped that in 1809. It was a bit of a disaster because of TPM attestation problems. We eventually decided, no, we can't support it on 1809. It's just too flaky. So we changed that to 1903. Now, 1903, with new devices, it works out pretty well. Uh, the TPM attestation issues are mostly resolved, but not 100%, which is why these two features are still in preview. We had to get to a point where we can get 99% success rates doing TPM attestation before we're willing to say that these are fully ready for anything you throw at. White Glove builds on top of self-deploying mode. Self-deploying mode enables the device to join Active Directory or Azure Active Directory with no credentials. We leverage that for White Glove as well, which is why the two of them are linked together. And the last one, uh, Windows Autopilot for existing devices. This is a config manager driven process using a task sequence to take a machine from Windows 7 to Windows 10 without pre-registering it for Autopilot, but having it go through the Autopilot process. So you drop a configuration file in place on the machine that says, when this boots up, it will check into the autopilot service, see that it's not registered, and say, well, I should behave like a non-autopilot machine. But it will see the configuration file and use that instead. So it's 
effectively an offline version of autopilot. That's for 1909, right? Not 1809, actually, really? for existing devices. Yeah, that one shipped with Windows 10 1809, initially supporting only Azure AD Join. We added support for hybrid Azure AD Join a few months later, but without any client code changes. Now, this is effectively Config Manager running a task sequence that drops Windows 10 on the device, injects drivers, drops in the JSON configuration file for autopilot, and then says, I'm done. It reboots into Windows 10 with no unattend.xml, nothing to automate the rest of the process. The task sequence completes in Windows PE. So when the device boots up, it's like a clean Windows 10 install. Boots into Ubi, reads the file, behaves like autopilot. So it's different than the task sequence integration that we talked about at Ignite. We'll get into that later. We then have a variety of features that cross scenarios. This is one of those, uh, because I can only present for 45 minutes at Ignite type of slides, Let's cram everything onto one slide, see if we can get through it quickly. Enrollment status page, we use to track the progress of the provisioning process. Initially, we could only track uh, policies, certificates, MSIs, and UWP apps in Windows 10, 1803. In 1809, we added support for tracking Office. In 1903, we added support for tracking Win32 apps being deployed from Intune. We've been working on some additional integrations like uh, making sure that the user ESP only shows up for the first user that signs into the machine. It actually right now could show up for every user that signs into the machine. Why does it matter? Well, when you deploy a machine with autopilot, the first user in, goes through, joins the device to AD or AAD, enrolls in Intune, device ESPs display, user ESPs display, and then they get to the desktop. During that process, the syncing with Intune, the polling interval is every three minutes for the first 15 minutes, every 15 minutes for the first two hours after that, and then every eight hours after that. So ESP is very dependent on that sync to figure out what's going to install and what, what does it still need to wait on. The second user that signs into this machine might sign in more than two hours and 15 minutes after the device has been deployed. It might be a day, a week, a month later. When they sign in, how often is Intune syncing? Every eight hours. So ESP shows up saying, identifying, it's trying to figure out what policies are needed by waiting for the next Intune sync to happen. It might take up to eight hours. No one wants to sit there for eight hours waiting for a screen to go away. So uh, we added an option that says, after the initial autopilot deployment, push a new policy to the, to the device to turn off ESP for the second and third and fourth and nth users on the device. So simple optimization. Uh, integration with Config Manager, we'll take a look at that on the next slide. And uh, we're trying to make it easier to turn on and off user ESP versus device ESP separately without using custom policies. We've been working on the device lifecycle management to make it faster to import devices through Intune to support larger batch sizes. Now you can upload 500 devices at a time. We have now shipped the ability to edit group tags and to assign computer names. So you can go into Intune, find an existing autopilot registered device and say that the group tag should be something else. You can also specify that when this device is deployed, the computer name that should be used is whatever text you put in. So rather than using the rules to specify a pattern, you could instead say, here's the exact computer name that I want to use. Now, I don't think you want to go in and edit every single device to do that manually, but you could write a PowerShell script that uses Graph API to set that. We're working on a new deployment report. We've been saying uh, for the last four weeks, it'll be there next week. Maybe it'll be there next week. I've kind of given up. I'm going on vacation after today. I hope that it will be published by the time I get back from vacation. So it will be there soon, but 
I'm starting to have my doubts on that Q4 calendar year 19 because we're running out of Q4 calendar year 19. We've also been working on the ability to collect logs remotely. So you could just push a button in Intune and have it grab all the autopilot logs. That's only somewhat useful for two reasons. One, it has to enroll in Intune in order for that to work. So if it fails before the Intune enrollment, sorry, tough. Two, the logs that it collects are kind of garbage. So yeah, it makes it easier to collect the garbage logs, but you'd much rather have non-garbage logs. So talk about that later too. We need to make it easier to configure Windows 10. We announced at Ignite the ability to do firmware configuration using the device firmware configuration interface, the FCI. Today, that only works with Surface, the new Surface devices that have shipped. We've contributed that back to Intel's UEFI open source EDK project for anyone who wants to implement that, but it's gonna take work by each of the OEMs to implement the same thing. We're working on the ability in Intune to remove inbox apps and to add language packs and features by building the UI inside of Intune so that you can just check off what you want or what you don't want and it'll add or remove them as needed. We've been working for a long time with the delivery optimization team because we need to get content to the machine. If it's coming from Intune, it's coming from the cloud. If you're going to deploy a thousand machines from the cloud, you really don't want each one of them going out and downloading it from the internet. With delivery optimization support, one machine downloads it, shares it with all the others. That's okay, uh, but we've had to work on support for uh, different content types and support for scenarios where the peers aren't reliable, like white glove. Let's say you get out a whole bunch of machines, you set them on the desktop and you start deploying them. One of them downloads the content. As soon as that machine's done, what does the technician do? They shut sure. it down, they put it in a box. Well, then the next one has to go download it again. Even if you said, well, I'm just going to leave one machine sitting there, the odds of delivery optimization saying use that machine are pretty low. It's going to give you a list of like the 20 most recent machines that it's talked to, which could be all in boxes. So as an alternative, they've now created this connected cache service that you can install on either a config manager distribution point or on a, a Windows server somewhere. And it will transparently cache all the content. So the client would first see, can I get it from a peer? If the answer is no, then it would check with the server and see, does the server have it? Only if the server doesn't have it, then it would go out to the internet. But when it goes out to the internet, it'll also save a version of it on the server so that the next client We'll get it from the server. So over time, the server can expand out its cache of all types of content. Windows updates, uh, Windows Store apps, the Office 365 Pro Plus updates, but not initial installs. The initial install support is in preview. You can try it out. I've got some blogs talking about how to do that. The one then that's missing would be Config Manager. Why does that matter? Well, let's say you're going to do white glove deployment and you're gonna pay an OEM to do it for you. The OEM's not going to have a distribution point. The OEM's going to want to point to your cloud management gateway. You don't really want every one of the machines that they're pre-provisioning to go out to the cloud management gateway and download that content. So we are still working on the Config Manager guys to say, please add delivery optimization support so that cloud content being downloaded will use DO. They want to complain about too many choices for on-prem machines with branch cache support and uh, SMS peer caching and delivery optimization support and alternate content providers and all the other options. Don't care. But in that one scenario where the devices are going out to the internet and downloading stuff from the CMG, I really want to use connected cache. So we beat on them probably once a week to say, hey, you need to do this. And eventually they'll relent, but it'll take a while. The last one on the list here is autopilot update. We want to be able to update the autopilot functionality 
without waiting for a new Windows release. So we built a mechanism into Windows 10 1903 to do that. So we can do fixes or new feature enhancements in Insider Preview builds and then backport those to Windows 10 1903, 1909, uh, 2004, every other release. How many of you noticed when we did one of those back in October? Good. <laughs> uh, it didn't go well. Uh, <laughs> well, here's the idea. A device that's registered with autopilot, when it boots up into UBI, should check to see if there's an autopilot update. And if there is, download it and install it. So how many machines would you expect to install something like that in the first, I don't know, two hours after it's released? It's probably going to be a very small number. It wasn't a very small number. It was something like 7 million. It's like, well, that's not quite right. So uh, they had accidentally targeted it to every device running Windows 10 1903. Not just those running pro and enterprise, but also those running home. So uh, yeah, if you look on your on PC, you might see an autopilot update from October that got installed. It didn't hurt anything, but wasn't quite what we intended to do. So they've now reworked the targeting. The other problem was when they initially released it, they discovered that it was incompatible with updates prior to the one that was released at the end of September. So it would break the enrollment status page. We had one customer that noticed it because they had provisioned a machine in the two hours before people started panicking and said, stop, hit the stop button, make it go away. But uh, they have now put in a rule that basically says you must be running at least the end of September cumulative update before you'll be offered an autopilot update. So we're now ready to try again. Guess when? Tomorrow. Guess when my vacation starts? <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> Not my problem. But if you do see anything weird going on, send a message out on Twitter. They'll be monitoring. But I think it will go better this time. You may not see it actually happen tomorrow because they'll likely publish it to a very small population of machines and then ramp it up over time. But it won't take them too long to ramp it up, but it'll be longer than hours. It might be. With that enabled, now any device running Windows 10 1903, uh, September, end of September update or later, when they boot up and see that their autopilot registered, they'll install the autopilot update, reboot, and then continue the process. That update includes fixes for hybrid Azure AD joint. It includes fixes for the enrollment status page. Just a bunch of fixes in there. It also enables a new scenario for hybrid Azure AD join, being able to do it over VPN. So we'll talk more about that in a moment too. So some features, mostly bug fixes. We've been, well, if we go back to when I first tried Autopilot, I was still in product management at that point. They said, hey, we got this new feature. Why don't you try it out? So the first thing I tried was, hey, how can I deploy a machine into Azure AD, enroll it in Intune, Intune installs the Config Manager agent, Config Manager agent runs a task sequence. After like four weeks of trying, I basically gave up because there was just, well, you could eventually make it work, but you couldn't make it work quickly because Config Manager client would install, it would report DDRs and inventory and collections would get updated and policy polling intervals would come into play. Yeah, maybe two hours later, it would wake up and run a task sequence. But no one wants to wait two hours to run a task sequence. You want to run one right away. So they built in to the Config Manager bootstrapper. When it installs the client, you can specify a task sequence ID, and it'll install it right away. It'll run it right away. So the Config Manager agent installs, the service wakes up, off it goes. Now that's... There's more work that went into it too, like being able to support content coming from a CMG in a task sequence. Being able to run a task sequence over the internet, that was something that was done uh, a few months back. So there are other dependencies that are still needed. This isn't the complete work that we need to do because 
Well, there's two other gotchas. One is with co-management. The other one is just with uh, integration with config manager with uh, autopilot. We want to be able to track the task sequence as part of the enrollment status page. We can't do that yet. So the task sequence will throw up a dialogue and show its progress. But if you had ESP enabled, it's not going to know to wait for that to finish. So it's going to drop you at the desktop before the process is actually done. Maybe not the end of the world. It enables the scenario. At least. The other problem that we've seen is Device goes through autopilot. Autopilot enrolls the device in Intune. Intune pushes out the config manager agent. When the config manager agent installs, uh, if you're familiar with code management and config manager, there's an idea of workload ownership. Are they owned by config manager? Are they owned by Intune? Well, when the config manager client installs, before it has checked in with the config manager management point, it records on the device that all workloads are owned by config manager. So as soon as the config manager client installs, Intune sees, oh, I don't own any workloads anymore, so it stops. It says, I'm not going to send any more policies. Well, Autopilot is most likely still waiting on policies. Like user signs in, it wants to display the user ESP, so it tends to cause timeouts. So there's this idea of workload flip-flop, because the Workloads are all initially owned by Intune. You install the agent. They all then flip to Config Manager. Then the policies are received, and some of them will flip back to Intune, depending on how you have uh, Config Manager configured. So they had to solve those two issues next. We have to be able to integrate with ESP, and we need to make sure that there's no workload flip-flopping as this process goes through. So if you're willing to turn off ESP, and if you aren't going to push anything from Intune except the Config Manager agent, this will work great. Outside of that, good luck. So when's that task sequence line <coughs> added to the CCM setup? It is there now. It's shipped with Config Manager 1910. So you can try that today. The ironic part, which I still don't understand, is it's shipped in the 1910 release, but it's still not in a tech preview. I don't know how they pulled that off. So I'm waiting for the next tech preview to come out so that I can try it in a lab. Because I run tech preview builds, not production builds. But it should come soon. So the basic flow that we always end up with is the IT admin creates profiles. They sync into the autopilot service. The vendor registers devices. Those sync into Intune. The device gets shipped to the employee. When it boots up, it talks to the autopilot service, sees that it's registered, downloads a profile and off it goes from that point to do the deployment. Behind the scenes, when we're provisioning the device, we need to start with that OEM optimized image and then we can layer on top of it, software settings, updates, features, user data, uh, everything that we need to get that device ready for productive use. Some of those we do better than others. We certainly have more work to do when it comes to uh, features and updates and things like that, but we can do a pretty good job with the software and settings and user data at this point. If we look at where we were, say, 18 months ago, if you wanted to use Intune to do this stuff without Config Manager, it could do Office 365 Pro Plus and it could install single file MSIs. And it could do settings. All the settings were there. But since then, it's added in a whole bunch of additional things like into management extensions to install Win32 apps. Security baseline so that you can do all the security settings you need. Administrative templates so that you can do GPO settings from the cloud. Uh, software update rings to control the Windows update for business behavior on the device. You can automatically configure OneDrive for business. You can turn a device into a kiosk with a simple profile and we can do firmware management. So all of that stuff didn't exist 18 months ago. So when you started with Autopilot 18 months ago, you had to be willing to roll your own. Now at least Intune has picked up all that functionality. If we look at scenarios, the user-driven hybrid Azure AD join scenario that we started with was the simplest of them. The device would boot up in Ubi, choose language locale keyboard, connect it to a network. In this case, it's a VM, so plug in the virtual Ethernet cable. 
then authenticate to Azure Active Directory. That's then used, those credentials are used to join the device to Azure AD, enroll the device in Intune, and push all the configuration down to the device. In this case, the device reboots because you still need a reboot to rename the computer. So Autopilot pushes a naming profile to the device, reboots the computer, afterwards you sign in to authenticate. In this case, it's using phone sign-in, so you don't need to put in your password. You just need to, uh, to acknowledge the request on your phone. We support phone sign-in and uh, multi-factor authentication today. We're hoping to add support for FIDO2 in the near future and other passwordless options as we get farther down the path. So we get the device joined, enrolled, and then we start pushing the policies to the device. That include all security policies, certs, any network connections, and all the apps that are pushed. When all those apps finish, then the user can be signed on for the first time using the same Azure AD credentials we typed in initially. So we'll see the first sign in animation, pulsing screen, and after that, ESP shows up again to be able to track all the user targeted policies. If you don't have any user targeted policies or if you don't care to track them, you can just turn off the user ESP after the sign in process completes. Which I believe uh, is on here. So, yeah, we'll see the account set up. It's waiting to figure out if there's anything to do, but probably very little stuff. I think I had one VPN connection defined that got pushed to the machine. Now it's fully configured and ready to go. Behind the scenes, I deployed Office and Chrome and turned on OneDrive and uh, configured desktop wallpapers and start menu layouts and those sorts of things. So all of that is pushed to into through into. That's obviously not real time. It took about 20 minutes to go through that on a, a virtual machine. So time really is mostly dependent on the apps that you're pushing down to the device. In the hybrid case, when we initially released this, the flow was basically here. We have our, we send our hardware ID to the autopilot service, it gets back a profile. It then knows that this is a hybrid Azure AD join deployment. So it knows the device needs to be joined to Active Directory. The device can't do that itself without credentials. <coughs> so the device will first enroll in Intune. Intune will talk to the offline domain joint connector running on a server in your environment. That creates an object in Active Directory for the device. It sends the offline domain join blob, like a chunk of data that represents that computer, back to Intune. Intune sends that on to the device. The device installs that blob, which completes the join process. So that process can happen completely over the internet even today. But uh, after the offline domain join blob is received, today we have a connectivity check to make sure that we can talk to a domain controller. Because the next step is going to be for the user to sign in using their Active Directory credentials, which requires talking to a domain controller. So we won't even reboot the computer unless we can get connectivity to the domain controller. So what we're planning to do for Windows 10, 19, and 3 and above is we will get rid of that ping test and assume that you're going to push something to the device during the device ESP phase, like a VPN client that the, the user can use to make a connection to the corporate network by the time they get to the logon screen. As long as you can do that, great, you can sign in and go. So that's what we're doing here. Same basic setup. We start off booting the device to Ubi, choose a language locale keyboard. We type in Azure Active Directory credentials. Those are used to authenticate the user and to enroll the device into Intune. After the device has been enrolled in Intune, it's going to wait for Intune to provide it that offline domain join info. Instead of then trying to ping the DC, it's just going to reboot right away. So finish authenticating. 
then do the Intune enrollment, and then it's just waiting for the ODJ response. It does a reboot, which completes the join and the rename of the computer at once. Afterwards, it's fully Active Directory joined, just the user isn't able to log on yet. So afterwards, ESP shows up. At that point, we can push all the policies, settings, VPN clients, certificates, anything else that might be needed to that device to prepare it for the next phase, which is going to be dropping the user at the Active Directory Windows logon page. So as long as something in here sets up the VPN client, great, it'll work. To enable this, we've just added a new setting into the autopilot profile that says simply no, skip the connectivity check because you're going to take responsibility for pushing something to the device to enable that. So all the device configurations done, we've dropped the machine at the Windows logon page where there's going to be an extra icon at the bottom here that you can click to make a VPN connection. So if you click that, in this case, it's using the built-in VPN client, but this could just as well be Cisco AnyConnect or anything like that. So I put in my credentials, we make a VPN connection. The credentials are then passed forward to Windows to complete the sign-in, and we're signed into Windows. So even though this device is on the internet, it's able to start a VPN connection to get connectivity so the user can sign in and the rest of the process just works. So that's what we're building out. It will require Windows 10 1903 plus that end of September update plus the autopilot update that comes out tomorrow or 1909 plus the autopilot update that comes out tomorrow or the current Insider Preview builds. We have the new option to skip connectivity checks. You have to do the work of getting the VPN connection in place. As long as those VPN clients support these pre-logon authentication modules, PLAP, or can automatically establish a VPN connection with no user interaction, then the process will work fine. In the autopilot profile, there's this new skip domain connectivity check option that we will enable. You won't see that in production yet. That will be uh, for our private preview initially and then opened up for everyone probably in February. We did some research just reading VPN client documentation to see which do we think can support this. We think pretty much all the major Win32 VPN clients will work just fine. There are things that won't work, like a UWP-based VPN plugin won't work because they don't work until the user signed in. Anything that requires a user cert for authentication won't work because you have to sign on as the user to get a user cert so that you can sign on as the user. It doesn't work. That's a circular reference. Uh, and we don't have any way of provisioning direct access today, so that won't work either. We haven't given up on it. We think we could do that, but for right now, we're focused on these third-party VPNs. So then it becomes a question of, well, how do you set these VPN clients up? Because just because they have the support doesn't mean you've configured that support. So uh, the mechanism needed to do that varies by VPN client. In the Cisco case, they call it start before logon. You need to set that up. Pulse Secure has a credential provider, Global Protect, pre-logon. Checkpoint does always auto-connect, always connected, Citric Net, Netscaler, same basic idea. So. It is going to be a different setup for each VPN client, but uh, we kind of leave that to you. In my case, since I was using the built-in VPN client, I just pushed a one-line PowerShell script out to the machine to create a all-user VPN connection, and then I have an RAS server set up to authenticate the user. So lots of different ways to make it work. We can't guarantee that every mechanism will work, but Hopefully, you can find one that does. If you looked at this with uh, any Connect client, it would look different, but the same idea basically works. Uh, this is the screen that we had looked at before. So we're doing a private preview of that later this month. Public preview sometime in the first quarter. Uh, my guess is that it'll end up in February. All right. 
10 minutes. Let's talk more about White Club. Remember before I said the end user gets an unprovisioned device and then they had to sit and wait. The OEM loads the OS and drivers, the end user has to wait through the rest. What we really want is to add another step in the middle to let someone pre-provision the device. So that's the idea behind White Glove. Whether it's IT doing this in a back room by covering desktops with machines or uh, someone doing this large scale factory style. We just want to enable the technician to boot up a machine and on this first screen in Ubi, hit the Windows key five times. When you hit the Windows key five times, you get a menu where you can choose Windows Autopilot provisioning. We will then check with the autopilot service and display information about the device, including the organization that it's registered to, the profile that's been assigned, and if there is an assigned user, it will show that as well. The QR code contains a unique device ID. We published a companion app in, on GitHub that you could use to look up the device in Intune to change its configuration if you wanted. Assuming you don't want to change anything, you click provision to start the process. It joins the device to AD or AAD, enrolls it in Intune, and then pushes the entire set of device configuration policies to the machine. So all the apps, all the certs, everything device targeted, as well as any apps that are user targeted if you pre-assigned a user. So if you say this device belongs to Anna, you could also install all of Anna's apps at the same time. So after that process is done, imagine you're the technician who's overseeing a room full of machines. Do you want to know when, that's de when that device is complete so that you can shut it down, put it in a box, and put the next one in its place? So when this finishes, we'll display a bright green screen to say that it was successful or a bright red screen to show that it failed. If it's successful, click the reseal button to shut it down, put it back in the box, send it on its way. If it's if it fails, well, you're probably not a highly skilled technician doing this process, so pick up the phone and call for help. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, a number of you have called me for help on these. And I'm not the, the permanent white glove support person. But. Device is done, shut down, put back in a box. Now you can send it on to the user. The user gets the device when they boot it back up again. It looks just like a normal autopilot. <laughs> the only difference is it takes five minutes instead of two hours because all the stuff is already there. So you don't have to wait for that. The deployment report, when we do ship it, will look something like this. Uh, basically, one line for every machine that's deployed showing the scenario, how long did it take, all that good stuff. So that's coming soon. From a roadmap perspective, we touched on a lot of these as we went through, but big two items, uh, VPN support, integration with Config Manager, those are still being worked on. The next two we've already shipped, deployment report soon, uh, aligning the naming for Azure AD and hybrid Azure AD, we'll work on that next year. Uh, guided scenarios to help us set up. ESP, we need to make it easier to target it to users versus devices. We need to document all of our networking requirements and we need to make it easier to configure Windows 10. We think we can get through most of that stuff in the next six to 12 months. Beyond that, we want to focus on troubleshooting and logging. I know it sucks, but we need to improve our logs. We need to make it easier to figure out when things go wrong. Uh, so we feel the pain. We'll work on that one. Uh, migration of an app settings from an old computer, we'll see what we can do there. I think migrating apps is easy. Migrating settings isn't. So we'll still see what we can figure out. Now that there is task sequence support, you could certainly continue using USMT, but it's just kind of messy. It can be done, and we'll probably show you how, but it's not necessarily the most seamless experience. Uh, we need to make the whole thing faster overall. Uh, I get really tired of staring at spinning dots, especially when you don't know why they're spinning dots. So we know why there are spinning dots in various places, and we know what we need to do to fix those. 
configuration of preferences should be easier as well. Like I want to configure the uh, desktop wallpaper. I want to configure the start layout. I want to configure the taskbar, but not as a mandated policy. I just want an initial value so that the user could change it after the machine's been deployed. That's surprisingly hard to do today. Uh, device lifecycle, we could always make improvements on that. And better handling of OS languages, if you're a multi-language company, we've got lots of things that we could do for languages. So that's probably 12 to 24 months from where we're at today. Those are our themes. Mostly it's going to be that first one, and probably the third one as well. When we talk about those internally, we call those rough edges. Uh, we had initially said we have quality issues in autopilot, and that made our developers mm -hmm. really uptight because quality issues means the developers are doing a crappy job. No, they're doing a fine job of implementing crappy stuff. <laughs> I mean, they were they built what they were told to build. What they told to build just wasn't good enough. So. Uh, we changed our terminology to make them happy. They're not quality issues, they're rough edges. We need to fix all the rough edges. But uh, those two are the primary rough edges, the troubleshooting and logging and the, the overall performance of the provisioning process. So those will keep us busy and employed for the next couple of years. Any questions? It's nice to have more than 45 minutes. The assumption that don't have um, the VPN set up for a ping. Seems like a bold assumption. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a no-win situation. Uh, when we initially were working on the uh, hybrid Azure AD join scenario, it was built to support the always-on VPN support in Windows. <laughs> Great, except no one's using the always on VPN support in <laughs> Windows. And our likelihood of success in getting anyone to switch from whatever VPN client they're using today to always on VPN is pretty close to zero. So we said, well, scrap that idea. We, we implemented that at one customer. It didn't go well because they wanted to use the always on VPN client. They wanted to continue using their existing VPN concentrator hardware. That didn't work. Well, it did sort of, but it didn't work well. So, yeah, we, we went to plan B. Plan B was, hey, we can't make you change from what you're doing today, so best we can do is try to integrate with what you have. Now, the assumption is, then, that the problem that we're trying to solve is a problem you already have. You need to be able to sign in and talk to an Active Directory domain controller when you're not on the corporate network. Like let's say you're like me, you take a month vacation, and you come back and you forgot what your password is. You're going to call the help desk. The help desk is going to say, sure, no problem, I'll reset your password. Well, if I'm sitting at home and you reset my password, I need connectivity in order to sign in to talk to a DC to validate that new password. How's that going to work? Using a VPN client that supports making a connection from the logon screen. So we're assuming that you already have a solution that's better than telling the employee to come into the office, sit down on the corporate network, sign in, and then go back home again. That's a whole assumption. That's still something. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't have that solution today, well, we're not inventing one for you. We're assuming that you you already have one of those to support that scenario. Or you're willing to change to a VPN client. Now, how many of you use direct access by chance? One. <laughs> That's the challenge. That we said, well, we could make this work for direct access because the direct access provisioning process is actually built on top of the offline domain joint process. You can have that ODJ blob contain all of the certificates and GPOs necessary to make direct access work. But we have to convince our that it's worth the effort. We had to find enough customers or enough big customers that are willing to use it. So it remains to be seen. Maybe we'll pull it off. I already got other, you know, have alternatives for when DA breaks. Yeah, that's, that would probably be the solution. Yeah, Anyways. you could bootstrap it with something else and then yeah. DA will take over later. But it would be so <coughs> easy to 
get that whole end to end process to work. Let's hope if we add support to doing it. I've made it work in a lab. That's the, the other challenge of a program manager who used to be a developer. If I don't like something, I just write the code. So I can make it work. So now I just need to convince our devs that it's worth support. We'll get there. Anything else? Or is it break time? What do you see as adoption of thought of that? We have total number of machines deployed is somewhere in the seven digits. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. The largest customer deployed has over 200,000 devices deployed. Uh, we've seen, I'd say overall, about 60% of machines deployed use Azure AD Joint. The other 40% hybrid Azure AD joint, which isn't the way we expect things to eventually end up. We do expect hybrid Azure AD joint to overtake Azure AD joint at some point because most customers aren't quite ready for joining their devices directly to the cloud. But the customers that were willing to adopt autopilot early on were basically willing to say, we'll throw away anything to solve the pain. The pain is it's too expensive to deploy Windows devices, we want to simple way, we're willing to do anything. So they've moved all the way to into an autopilot, got rid of all their on-prem infrastructure. So that ends up inflating the Azure AD joint numbers. The hybrid numbers will over time catch up. Yeah, and depending on the type of customer, that's sometimes easier than uh, for others. Uh, if you have a very mobile workforce today, easy. I can be a big consulting firm. Why do you need Active Directory? Your machine, your employees are probably never in an office anyway. So for them, yeah, it's easy to say, let's just switch all of those over to Azure AD Join. We'll manage it via Intune. We don't need heavy management at all. We just need to make sure they're secure and that we can keep them up to date. That's it. Should this work uh, today for people that don't have Intune yet until they enabled the new memory seat stuff? It is most definitely dependent on Intune. Uh, even the free license grant with Config Manager probably won't be sufficient because of the ordering of the operations. The Config Manager license is designed to enable a Config Manager managed device to become co-managed without an additional license. In the autopilot scenarios, it's the other way around. The device enrolls into first, and then could become co-managed by deploying the Config Manager agent. Today, that into enrollment would fail if you don't have an into license. So into is required, the license is and still debating that one. Is that included in anything? Uh, if you have EMS or Microsoft 365, E3 or E5, they include the, all the necessary support for doing this. And no G3? Uh, Microsoft 365, G3? Maybe. A3? Yeah. Uh, what type of? Organization. Uh, we're using G3 O365, I believe, and then we just bought P1. Okay, so uh, O365 is kind of separate from that. Uh, P1 would be Azure AD Premium, so that's required. But O365 by itself would be sufficient. You would need. Microsoft 365 or add EMS to your to replace your ADT one. All right, break time. Oh, yeah, all right, uh, everyone, have, have a seat. Yeah. So, we sit around the stay on track here. So, uh, next up, we have Jeff. Yeah, Jeff, 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 Jeff,
config manager stuff. He's he's been around the config management scene for a good number of years. But yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for sponsoring. And uh, we got a raffle towards the end. Also, stay tuned for that. But um, he's gonna go through everybody's favorite topic, and I think tomorrow's Patch Tuesday, right? Yeah. Yeah. Patching. So. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to him. Cool. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, so my name is Justin Chalfant. I uh, am the founder of Patch My PC. Uh, what we do is third-party app management for Config Manager. And the way that we generally do our, our user group sessions is we'll actually go through setting up the product and basically go from having no third-party updates or apps being managed to having everything configured in about 45 minutes or so, start to finish, just to show you how simple our product can be. Um, so just a little background on the lab. Um, we can see we're running 19.11. I mainly do that, so if something goes wrong, we can blame Config Manager, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, we don't have any third-party patches configured, so we can see it's pretty clean here. Same thing with apps. So if we look in the apps node, we can see we don't have anything going on, going on here as well. Um, so first step to set up our product would be just to grab our MSI. So this gets installed in your top-level software update point within your environment. This is going to be what's used to choose which products you want to publish as a third-party update, uh, as well as a third-party application. So we'll take a look at what that looks like. Only a couple megs, so super lightweight. Just go ahead and go through kind of the defaults here, and then do OK on that. Launch that up, we'll get going. So uh, how many of you guys have done anything with third-party updates, whether it's native through the console, maybe you scuff in the past? Cool. So as far as Purex go, this is a requirement for just the Windows uh, um, update agent, where if you are publishing third-party patches to WSOS and then sync them to Config Manager, you do need to have a certificate in place so they can validate they're coming from a trusted source, right? So since these are not Microsoft updates, that's kind of the, the first prereq that we would need to look at here. So you have a few options that you can configure for that. You can either import a cert from a CA, so if you're using Active Directory, PKI, uh, you could import one from a trusted CA. Now the other option, which is probably the easiest, is in Configman 1806, they came out with this new option where you can let SCCM manage the cert for you. So what that means is it will generate a self-signed cert and it will automatically distribute that to your clients using client policy. So we're going to go ahead and uh, enable that really quick. And then we're going to quickly just sync our software update point because that's the process that will actually generate this cert. So after you enable that, the next sync, we'll see in the wsyncmanager.log, we'll actually see Config Manager making that cert for us. So here in a second, it should kick in. And that's really how, with 18.06 or newer, the prereqs can all be handled directly in the console now. Previously, you would either have to generate a self-signed cert using our tool or import one, and then you would generally have to distribute that to your clients using a GPO. But now with uh, this new setting, it can now be handled for you. So for example, if we come back into our software update point, we can see that search now gonna show up in that third party update tab. The only thing once you see that uh, generated that you have to do to get your clients to trust it is there's a new client setting. This has actually been out since 1802 to allow third party updates on your devices. So we look over here under software update, uh, we can see this new setting here at the bottom, enable third-party updates. So that's going to set the local GPO that tells your clients they can install non-Microsoft updates, and that will also have them install the WSUS signing cert that ConfigMan can make for you now. Um, so now if we come back into our tool, now that SCCM is managing that, we're going to see the cert is now green and we detected that code signing cert that was configured through SCCM. So that's really all we have to do from a prereq side. Now, as far as testing this out, you, you kind of have two options here. So the same trial page that I got the MSI, you can do full access 30-day trial heal here by just submitting the form. Or if you only want to test a smaller subset of products, you can enable trial mode and you don't need to send us any information. It's just going to limit you to a smaller subset of about six products that you can publish as an update or an application. But if you want everything, you would just submit that form and you'll get a URL like this. And that's going to give us access to the entire catalog for 30 days if you just want to test things out. So two different options there, depending on how in-depth of a uh, technical trial that you want. Uh, so first thing that we're going to go over is updates and apps. So uh, we support third-party software updates. So this is kind of where we started off, is the patching space. 
where we can update apps that are already deployed within your environment. So what's going to happen is these products we enable as an update, they're going to sync into your uh, software update point, you're going to see them in all software updates, and be able to patch those for existing devices. Uh, and then the second thing that we're going to kind of look at is something that's relatively new is going to be application. So the, the big thing that we were getting from our customers is update only solves one problem, right? So it's, it's those, once they're already installed, that's where you get the value for that. But as far as keeping your base apps up to date, there was still a lot of packaging time where you would have to initially package those apps and potentially keep them up to date uh, periodically. So you may not want to have your task sequences installing these super outdated vulnerable apps before a software update scan cycle would kick in and start doing that. So now we've kind of done updates and apps and we'll show you what that looks like. Cool, so we're gonna start out in the updates tab. So these are going to be products that you wanna publish as a software update. So it's gonna look very similar to your software update points products like for Microsoft stuff. We also document on our products page just the list of kind of all the products that we have. So quite a large list of supported products we have today. And I think the biggest thing to note is that, let's say you go through the list, you download the Excel sheet or just look online and there's something that we don't support. We do have a user voice for that. So let's say that we want to look at the app request. So you can always come in here and kind of submit new products that we may not have today. So you can come in, vote on it, monitor, similar to the way that Configman has their own user voice there. Now, um, you know, there's a big list of these products, right? So you may not really know where to start. So what we did, we implemented a database scan feature. What this is going to do is going to query the hardware inventory of your Configman database and aggregate based on the products that we support, so 300 and some odd apps, which one of those are already installed within your Configman site based on the hardware inventory that you're getting back from clients. So it just makes that process of saying, hey, I don't know what I, what I may want, instead of going for a couple hours, just kind of think, choosing what you think you have, to actually knowing, based on inventory, what products are out there that we support today. So you can come in here the first time you set this up and kind of configure either by selecting everything, you could sort by kind of the counts to see you know, which products are installed on the most number of devices, for example, uh, and then just quickly enable everything that you select here. So a process that would have taken a long time to kind of depend, uh, you know, choose what you want based on what you don't know is now only a couple of clicks. Now a few other cool things that we can do here is that we can uh, enable this to happen during every synchronization. So for example, let's say that you wanted new products that we add to be automatically enabled based on them being installed on a specific number of devices. So what will happen is when we run our synchronization, we'll get the latest uh, products that we support, run a query and depending on whether they meet the criteria of say one, two, 10, 15 devices, you can have them automatically trigger on without ever having to come back into our UI here. So pretty, pretty easy to add new things as they come out, even if you're not sure, right? But for this demo, we're gonna just enable a couple just for time's sake. Uh, but before we get started on actually enabling a product, I wanna go over a few of the options that we can apply globally. So if we right click the all products tab, we can choose to automatically close any application processes prior to installing an update. So this is a auto kill for the first one. So it will close that process to make sure that there's no files in use if you wanted to go that route. The second option is, oh, question? Feel free to ask questions like throughout the session too. Usually these are pretty uh, interactive as we go throughout. Uh, if you don't wanna be that aggressive, you can choose to just skip it if it's in place and it will attempt during the next software update deployment and evaluation cycle on the client, that option here. We can also delete public desktop shortcuts, so products like Chrome, where they would put that uh, shortcut on all users' desktop, we can delete that automatically when that patch is applied. Another helpful one is turning off self-update, so uh, you know when a product gets uh, updated, if the update was not already disabled, we can automatically do that for you, and I'll show you in the logs how, how you can see that happening real time on the client side. And then lastly, this one's actually quite helpful for troubleshooting, it's logging. So what we can do if you enable logging at the all products level, let me just copy a UNC path just as an example. Uh, we can choose to enable logging. So this is gonna be for the vendor's installer file, whether it's an EXE or MSI. Uh, we can automatically put all installation logs in a folder. So by default, we create a subfolder under CCM logs that every install log for any product that we update will go into. 
Uh, actually, an option that came from Brian Mason is, uh, let's say an update fell, so it gives you a non-zero exit code. You can have those failed logs go to a secondary location if you wanted to. So only the ones that are non-zero, you probably don't care about every single log going like a, a UNC path. But let's say that we're getting bad updates, they're failing. You can automatically have those MSI and EXE logs from the installer get put in like a shared UNC folder. Okay, so for this demo, we're gonna actually do Google Chrome. So we're gonna do the 64-bit version of Chrome. Now, once we get into the, you have a question? Uh, does the user have, does a user have to be logged in or can you have the machine just waiting for a login prompt for the staff in the background? Sure, yeah, so the user does not have to be logged in um, for the update or the app. So all of these are configured to run under system, whether or not users logged in, yep. Cool, uh, so right clicking at the product level for Chrome, we can see that we have three additional options that you can define at the product level. So if you wanna add a pre or post script during the Chrome update, you can do that. So for example, for Chrome, what we're gonna do for this demonstration is point out to a PowerShell script that sets the home page. So if we just go look at the script, we can see we're just doing some basic reg values. We're setting the home page to patchmypc.com and then a few different password policies within Chrome. So we support uh, VBScript, PowerShell, VBS, and you can even have EXEs or MSIs run as a pre or post action for a product if you wanted to. So if you wanted to like have some type of additional plugin go into a product update, pretty easy to add that as a pre or post action. You can also include arbitrary files or folders. So say that you want to launch like PS App Deploy Toolkit as some custom pre UI or something, you can include any additional folders or files for your pre or post scripts to run correctly. Yep. Is the post action, does that happen after the patch installs, but before the reboot or after the reboot? It, it would happen, um, so it would happen after the patch is installed before reboot. So we would, we would run the vendor's installer. Um, we would get the return code of that. We would all in the same process that's monitoring the install. We would then run the post script and then we would return the uh, return code from the vendor's installer. So that would happen before you got any reboot code that the postscript would run. So what if it's necessary for the reboot to happen before the postscript runs? Um, good question. So you would need to restart before the postscript right. in a scenario like that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So today, we what's a scenario where you may need that? Um, Autodesk, for example. Autodesk okay. sometimes requires a restart of the of the PC before you can apply your custom scripts. Okay, probably a task sequence in that scenario. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool, uh, and then the other two that you can do here is you can append a command line. So let's say you want to add a product key or some custom switch to a vendor's installer. You can um, have that apply. And then if it's an MSI based product like Chrome, you can also include a transform. Now these customizations are also saved for any future updates that come out to that product. So let's say, I configured this for Chrome, it published version 75 and then 76 came out, all the same settings would be applied and that next update gets applied to a device as well. Um, so pretty helpful where you don't have to keep coming in here for every update. Okay. And then the last one we're gonna look at is Java 8 32-bit for our update. So if I right click on that, we can see we have all the same kind of global options. Now Java's one that's a little bit special where we, <laughs> So there's a few things special about this one. Uh, but from this right-click perspective, what you're gonna see on Java is we include a script that's enabled by default. We call it a patch my PC defined script. What this will do is remove any previous JREs for that version that you're installing. So by default, uh, their installer will not remove older runtimes. So we will opt in to a pre-action that you can optionally disable. So we'll remove all the old versions, before installing the new one, so you only have one when you're done with that update. Okay. Can you have it not upgrade past that spot where you need licensing anymore? Yeah, you. Yeah, um, yeah. So licensing, that's that's a fun topic since uh, update 211 came out. Um, so the way the way that we support JRE since it came up for after licensing is we have this feature called an offline repository. So if there's a product like Java where you do need to have a license and a portal to log into, we have this folder that you can define where you stage the content. 
Java is the only update that requires this today. So what would happen is if we ran a sync and the file wasn't here, you could get an email alerts or a Teams notification saying, hey, uh, so Java comes out on a quarterly basis. So every quarter when a sync runs right after we release that Java update, you would, you would get notified if you hadn't already downloaded it saying, hey, here's the new Java binary. You would have to download this in order for us to publish it. Um, and that, that only applies for Java today. So just about everything else can be automatically downloaded from the vendors, but just do the licensing where we already had that product supported. That's why we kind of came up with this offline repository feature. Cool, so that's the two products that we're gonna enable for software updates. Now applications, uh, pretty basic what we have here. So there's a few app options that you have to pre-configure. So you're gonna configure your provider, right? So that's gonna be how we talk to config man, know how to create apps, where you want your UNC path to be for your app sources. So um, we're gonna append a application subfolder, then a vendor folder, then a product folder, and then just for each specific update that we publish, or uh, sorry, application, a unique GUID for each of those. So you would just define your root path here and we would handle the rest. Now we do have a few options that just kind of apply to apps in general in Config Man. So for example, do you want the checkbox to allow the app to be installed from attached sequence? Uh, and just a few other ones that correspond to the app properties within Config Man. One super helpful option, just based on how many votes it got that was really popular, is the ability to automatically move <laughs> applications that we create to a folder within the console. So for example, if we come and look at the console, we can see that what we're browsing within our tool is the same folder structure that we see within config man. So let's say that you wanted all applications created from our tool to go into the subfolder. You could define that at the global level here to have any apps that we create automatically go into that folder. Cool. And then kind of the other main option that we have is how do you want updates to be handled for your apps? So by default, let's say that we publish uh, Chrome 75 when we first configured this. What do you want to do when 76 comes out? By default, we update the existing app that we created in place, meaning that we're going to go download the latest MSI from Chrome, uh, update your content source within your deployment type, and then update your DPs. So that if you had that same app reference in a sequence, you would always be deploying the latest version of that product. Optionally, if you want more control over what you're doing, you can choose to create a new app whenever a new update comes out. So then you would have uh, an application for each version. So maybe you want more version control. You want to be able to revert back if something happened. You can choose to create a new one. There. Cool. And then last option is distribution point group. So if you want to automatically distribute the apps that we create to a DP group, you can choose that here. Okay, uh, now since we've already configured a bunch of products for our software updates, we can duplicate any of those products and enable them for apps as well. So if I just click this copy icon, we can even choose to copy any of the right click custom actions that we apply. So I'm gonna choose to copy those as well. So we can see we automatically got Java enabled and then we automatically got Chrome. We also have the same pre-script option that we configured, turning off updates, deleting shortcuts, all those things that we configure for the updates, we just duplicated them over because we wanted them to be created as an app as well that you can deploy even if it's not there. Now, with regards to apps, there are a few additional items, right, that are relevant to apps but not updates. So kind of these last four would only be applicable in the applications tab. So for example, uh, let's go to 7-Zip. So this is one that we didn't enable as an update, but we are going to enable as an app. Let's say that we want to set the max runtime to 15. So that's going to correspond to the max runtime within your deployment type. Uh, another cool one is that we can add the executable name and the install behavior. So this is the new feature that came out in 1702, where if the process is in use, you can like notify the user via software center if they click on like the message from the app install that the app needs to be closed. So maybe you have a problematic app that needs to be closed, but you don't want to auto close it. You could always use an app to deploy that type of update if you wanted to. And then uh, this was also another pretty popular user voice. If you want to choose a separate subfolder per product, so for example, we want 7-zip product updates or product uh, applications to go in this separate subfolder, you can get more custom at the app level. And then lastly, by default, we're going to use just the vendor's app information. So for example, this would be like 7-zip 9.20 for the app name. You also have your localized app name that shows in software center and description as well as icon. 
So uh, we're going to set all that from the vendor by default. So all the vendors, icons, things like that. But if you wanted to customize that, you have the ability to do that as a right-click option. So kind of the biggest use case for this was uh, customers using MDT UDI or UI++ where the task sequence maps to a specific name for the app and you don't want that to change. So that's where you could configure a specific name here. Because by default, we're going to update the apps in place and they would get the new version number in the app name. So if you ever had a scenario where you didn't want that to happen, you can configure that here. Cool. All right, any questions while we wait for the sync to happen? Cool. So the synchronization this is going to be how often our publishing service is going to check out with our catalog to see if there's any new updated apps or new software updates, right? So by default, we sync every night at 7 p.m. So since third-party updates don't really correspond to Patch Tuesday, for example, if we look at our release history in this RSS feed, we're generally doing about three to four catalog updates per week. Right, so third-party products, they just come out all the time. So we'll open up a few of these recent releases. And within kind of the RSS feed or email newsletter that you can get, we're gonna include like all the new updates, whether they were security related, um, feature updates or bug fixes. Uh, if they have CVIDs, we also include that within the feed. You can quickly jump out to things like vendor release notes here. And we also scan every uh, binary through virus total. So before any update or app would come out, that installer would get run through virus total, and we would include that within our release information. All right, so while this sync is occurring, uh, the way that you can get uh, stay notified as new things come out, we have two ways that we can do that. So we can enable SMTP emails. So whenever a synchronization runs and it publishes new updates or apps, you would get an email that includes all the new changes that happened within your environment. The other really cool one that's relatively new is Teams Alerts. So you can configure a Teams webhook, which we can see that we just got some notifications here. So we can see that the Chrome update was just published about, uh, yeah, just like right now. Um, so, we, <laughs> so we can see that uh, within that notification that we got within our Teams channel, uh, you get a lot of helpful details. So for example, release notes for that specific update will be clickable and take you out to the vendor's release notes. We're also going to tell you whether uh, it was a certain classification. So for Chrome, we can see this was a security update with a critical severity level, and it had a bunch of CVEs, right? So these are all clickable as well, where it will go directly out to the National Vulnerability Database, where you can get details about that specific CVID that was fixed within the update just published to your environment. We can also see we just had Java publish. So now the ones that we should be waiting on are the apps. So we just had a new app created in SCCM for uh, Chrome, Java, and we should have 7-Zip popping up here anytime. Ah, 7-Zip is already done. So now that the sync is completed, I'll show you what the email alerts look like as well. So if you wanted to do email alerts, uh, it's the same type of details here. So let me just click that to make that better. Uh, you're going to see things like the new updates and the new apps that were published. This is also linkable, so this will go right out to the vendor release notes. Same type of data for the classifications and severity levels and CVIDs would all be relevant for the emails as well as the Teams alert, just depending on which ones you may want. Yep. Are all these features here in the uh, the trial the limited catalog? They are, yeah. So all these features are available in the trial as well. Yep. Uh, cool, so that's really all there is to our initial configuration. So that's how you would set up our publishing tool. The idea that that we have when we develop this is it's really probably going to be a one-time configuration. Going forward, the only thing that you're probably going to care about are the notifications that you're getting when new things come out, right? So either your emails or your Teams alerts. Outside of that, this just runs as a service based on the synchronization schedule that you configure is when new third-party patches and apps will be available. So jumping over to the Config Manager console, we can see that we've already got our patches showing up here. So one option that I didn't cover is within our publishing tool, you can choose whenever there's a new third-party update that publishes to WSUS, we can trigger your software update point to sync right away. So that's an optional setting. If you want your updates to start showing up in your console right away, instead of waiting for your next scheduled software update point to sync, 
we can trigger that for you if you want. So that's why we're seeing these within a few seconds of them being published. So that's the two updates. We'll give it a second just to see some scan data, but we'll look at the apps while we wait for that. So we can see we have our Java and Chrome app within the Patch My PC folder. So that's kind of that root level that we define, right? So within here, uh, we're gonna have all the metadata. So app name, software center details, lease notes, uh, privacy URLs, keywords, and icons. So the things that you want for a good software center experience for your users will ought to be populated uh, within the UI here. And then of course we have our 7-zip app, so we define that to go to a separate subfolder at that product level, same type of info here. So we can see that we now have the app for 7-zip created as well. So for the apps, you can deploy these just like any other ConfigMan app, whether that's through cache sequences or collection deployments uh, for those product installs. And then kind of our idea is once they're out there, you can then use the software update feature to manage them going forward, right? So once an app has been installed and it's now an update for your existing devices, you can then use that software update feature to keep it compliant going forward. Now, with regards to the way that we would deploy these, it's no different than Microsoft updates. So for example, if you wanted to add a search in here, you could do something like show me all updates from vendor patch my PC. So depending on how you create your software update groups, you could either create a search and kind of do that monthly, or of course you could use ADR. So within our example, we can see we've already got this deployed. So we had an ADR pre-configured that's just deploying any patch my PC update. So non-superseded, critical security, or an update where the vendors patch my PC. So that's kind of the criteria that you could use if you wanted to include all third-party updates in a single software update group within an ADR. Now, of course, within here, you have all the same deployment options. So for example, in our deployment, we have three different deployments. We have two going to pilot and then one to production. So you're gonna be making use of all the existing uh, you know, options that you're using in SCCM today. Things like collections, deadlines, user experience, whether you wanna see it in software center, maintenance windows and restarts, are all gonna be exactly what you'd be doing for Microsoft patches. You could even include these in your same SUGs that you create with ADRs, even for Microsoft updates if you wanted to. Cool. So that kicked off, it downloaded our content into a deployment package that automatically went out to our DPs and it created our software update groups for us using that ADR. The only other thing I'm gonna do before we jump over to a client is deploy our apps. So we're gonna deploy those three apps to the all users collection, just using a PowerShell script to save a little bit of time. Uh, any questions before we jump over to the client? Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anything else while we're so, so wait, uh, <laughs> more of a anything else <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. does it clean up like previous package app application it creates as a new yeah yeah it's like, configurable so by default we update in place so we would basically let's we have time how much time do we have Mike? we good. cool so basically what will happen when a new update comes out, if you use the default behavior where it's gonna update in place, basically this content GUID for that Chrome app that's now old will get deleted. So what will happen is we'll download the new MSI, any custom scripts that you may have here, for example. Uh, we would then change the deployment type of reference to the new folder, and then we would delete the folder that existed for the previous version of that app, and then update your DP. So, if you, if you chose the default behavior of only updating in place, it would only be one app content. Now, if you created a new app each time, you would have multiple folders in here for each version of the product that comes out. So, yep. And so is that working like software updates where you're only downloading content that's applicable? Like it's one big package, right? So yeah, so for, for your software updates specifically, uh, it, for the client side, it would only download the update within the deployment <coughs> package that's applicable or required. Right, so you could target potentially all the third-party updates, and if only 10 were required, that's the only ones that would get downloaded to the CCM cache, just like a Microsoft update. Yep, yeah. Um, with Adobe products, sometimes, for example, they'll update CC, and there's a, a the update for Photoshop or InDesign or something like that is a new version of the software, but we need to be able to keep the old version sure. for existing compliance with is it projects that are already in place that are not compatible with the new software. Okay, that, yeah. So the product that? was specific to like new major versions of products. So for example, TeamViewer is a good example of that where they have new major versions 
right? So, so in that scenario, we would have a different product for each version that's currently supported for the major version. So in that scenario where it was a licensed product, we would only update you to the current version of the major one install, right? So you would have a different update for each of these products within this list, for example. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you do anything with supersedents? Good question. Um, yeah, so that's going to be like the next thing that we're, we, I think we've already got a user voice for it. Today, we don't use supersedents. Basically, we need to test like how many relationships we could realistically retain um, and then see how that would impact the provider. Um, but supersedents is something like native supersedents with an SECM is something that we're going to be looking at soon. Yeah, but it's something that we have on the radar. Uh, oh yeah, well, while we're looking at user voice, um, we also have a public roadmap. So patchmypc.com forward slash roadmap. So this is where you can see all the new features that we've shipped, as well as all the new products that we've added within the last couple of months, right? So a little bit choppy, um, but yeah, so you can see that pretty much all our features come from user voice, right? So any, any item that we get from a customer We'll tag that as orange for customer tags. So you can see pretty much everything we ship is based on feedback from our customers. So we can see we have, you know, maybe eight new products that came out uh, in September. Uh, and this is where you can kind of see all the new features that we're adding. So very much moving quickly with uh, items that we're getting from our customer. Kind of the big thing that we're working on today is Intune support. So we're just now starting to look at what we can do with Graph for managing apps in Intune. So that's kind of the next big thing that we're actively developing now. And hopefully we'll have something to update within the coming months to at least show you what status we're at today. So today it's started um, and we'll see how that goes in the coming months. Yeah. Does the client update itself? This client, what was the question? Up. Does the, uh, the service client, does it update? Itself? Oh, oh, yeah. So our service by default, like on the server side, like that one install, will update itself in place. So whenever we run a sync, if there's the new version available, um, you would have it update by default. Optionally, if you don't want that to happen, you could disable self-updates within the tool. And also the release notes page, just so you can see like all this cool stuff we've been added. Uh, we do kind of document each release out, and you can kind of see all the new features that we're adding based on that roadmap and user voice that we have. Um, so usually it's about every two weeks is, is what we're shipping out today. Um, probably the next month or two will be a little slower just because we're working on a lot of Intune stuff. So it's, it's going to be maybe a few preview builds coming out, and it's obviously that's a big feature. It's going to take time. Uh, cool. So jumping over to the client side. Yeah. Is there any publishing that needs to be done on prior to it getting into the update groups? Is there any publishing? Like how? Well, uh, in order for it to be synced from whatever, from the uh, PC location, once it's in, do you have to publish it in order for it to show in the suburb? Sure, yeah. So the publishing is actually what this tool is essentially doing, right? So when we chose the products for Chrome and Java, <laughs> and our sync. That's actually what publishes to WSUS. So it downloads from Google, downloaded from Chrome in this example, and uh, Java. And when I trigger that sync, that's basically what happens. So in the logs, we can see where we're actually uh, publishing, comparing hashes, and putting all this within WSUS. And then where, when it showed up in SCCM right away, that's because we had this option to auto sync our SUP whenever any new updates are published. So that's how things kind of happen really quickly within this scenario. But essentially our tool is what's gonna publish the updates to WSUS automatically based on your sync schedule, as well as auto create and update the applications within SECM. So that's all what happens within the sync schedule without you having to do anything. And that's where those notifications, like the Teams alerts, that's where you can see all that happening in real time. Yeah. So basically it, you can think of it as if you've used SCUP, like an automated version of that with a lot more customizations that you can perform. So are the files coming from you guys or are they getting it from yeah. the vendors? Yeah, good question. So where do the files come from? Um, so it's going to be from the vendors for the vast majority of products. So as far as like things like firewalls and things like that, um, we've got a list that describes the domains that you need to have open. 
And then these are kind of the product ones. So this is where, for example, if you had Wireshark enabled, this would need to be enabled, this port, and this is why, for example. So depending on what products you have, you would need to open those domains or optionally, if you just wanted to open everything in here, you could choose just to open that in your firewall if you needed to open it. Yep. Do you have that as a XML that can be subscribed to directly from the firewall? Good question. Um, so we, we could easily post a CSV. That's essentially what we import into this table. We don't officially have a URL like where you could grab the CSV today, um, but that would be easy for us to add in. And then, so you're saying like a firewall could ingest that <coughs> periodically, automatically, and then, yeah, we, we definitely do that. Uh, we don't have it today. This is the first time I got that request, but it would be easy from our end to add that. So if you have a, a, a job that you're running and one of the updates from one of the vendors is, is there's an error that comes up with it and they, they, they repost it on their website so that we can, we can just take that job, edit it, and post it to that vendor, go back out, get the, the, the update and reapply that? Yeah, so if an update fell during the publishing, uh, let's say the, the site was unavailable, you got 403, something like that, um, the next sync would try to republish it, right? So it would go try to download it again. Um, so it would just reattempt. Okay, but what about if the vendor finds out that there's a problem with their update and we need to go and grab another version of that update again, try to take that same job, copy it essentially, pull out everything else but that one vendor and reapply? Um, so if, if a vendor pulled an update, we would essentially revert the update in our catalog. Um, you wouldn't have to uncheck anything because anything that's already checked would probably already be published. So it would just be skipped during the sync. Okay. Um, so I don't think you would really have to like, let's say there's a fix for Chrome that came out and they reverted back. You wouldn't like have to go uncheck everything else because if there's an issue and we, we reverted back or something, it would just auto publish that new revised or reverted update, for example. But along that statement, if you are having to pull the update due to the error. You go, go into the application and run the install, uninstall, and all those lines. Yeah, good question. So the question was, if you have to revert back, so since it's not natively supported in the software update model from Figman, that's actually where the applications within our tool can actually really help, right? So you could deploy the new app as an uninstall. You could even do like some supersedence if you wanted to, where you could have the new one uninstall, revert back to the old one. So that's another cool improvement that came out when we started supporting apps that we couldn't do previously in updates because you can't uninstall or even revert even Microsoft updates in SCCM. So the new app model can give you scenarios where you could revert back if you wanted to. Yep. Sweet, so on the client side, uh, let's just dig into this so we're gonna have some logs that we can look at some pretty cool stuff going on. Um, but essentially on this machine, we've got some outdated apps. So we have an outdated version of Chrome and Java. So if we kind of look at what's going on here, we can see we have Java version 75, Java 8, or I'm sorry, Chrome 75, Java 8, 161. So since these are out of date, you can see uh, this was part of our uh, pilot group, so the deadline set for tomorrow, but we had it show up in Software Center. Um, so quick thing on what we can look at with Chrome. So currently the uh, homepage is just Google, so nothing custom here. We can also see there's a public desktop shortcut for all users. So we look at this location, we can see that there. So I'm going to go to click install. What we should see happen here is that shortcut's going to get deleted. The self-update feature is going to get disabled for Chrome. And the home page is going to get set using the PowerShell screen. So we can see we just automatically created that folder for the installation logs for vendors. So this is actually Chrome's MSI in verbose logging in case something happens. So rather than getting a generic 1603 exit code like you would probably get for most installations that fell, you could actually have a log to see what happened during that installation process and why it fell. In addition to the vendor's log within the root of CCM, we also have this patch my PC script runner. So if you've enabled any customizations, uh, this is where you can see everything happening in relation to updates and applications getting installed. So for example, we can see that we ran Chrome's MSI we can see the logging parameter that we auto uh, created based on the folder you defined. We then can see we got Xcode zero. We deleted the public desktop shortcut for Chrome. We set three different reg values to disable the self-update feature of Chrome. And then lastly, we ran that post update script and we can see the Xcode of that as well. And then we complete the install. So this is where your question might, where if you had a script, it would all complete in the same process 
but it would return the exit code of the actual update file. So even if your script returns something different, it would be based on the updates installed and for what we return at the end. So if there's a reboot required with like a, a 3010 exit code, that's when, depending on how you set the restart behavior, that would then be configured within the update itself. So now that the shortcut's deleted, we can see if we go ahead and op open up Chrome, from the start menu, we can see that PowerShell script configured uh, the homepage. If we look here in the Help tab and look at About, we can also see based on that right-click option for turning off updates, we disabled that where the user couldn't go in and update themselves, for example, if you wanted to control that globally. And then lastly for uh, Java, so if we go ahead and look at Java really quick, we can see we've got the update tab configured. So when we initially deployed the CXE, we didn't do anything custom. So we can see the self-update tab is showing up. If we quickly go into the Java update policies, nope, nope, software, Java soft maybe, 32-bit, Java soft, Java update policy. So we can see just the standard enable updates is set to one. I'm going to go ahead and kick this off. Now, since we enabled the option to close conflicting processes, we're going to see the Java control panel app auto-close and also the update notification taskbar, that auto-closed as well. Within that same Patch My PC script runner, we can see the logging of all this happening as well, right? So we can see we killed three Java processes. We then ran the pre-action to uh, remove old JREs. And now we're running the Java installer. So if we go back to the vendor folder, we have Java's EXE installer showing up within our vendor install logs as well. In case something happened, you could troubleshoot that based on the vendor log. So this should uh, complete here in just a second. Um, but what we'll notice once the install is done, we'll see about four different reg values get created here to turn off the self-update feature of Java. So we can see all that happening within this log as well. So if we were to come back in here and refresh, we can see everything's now been turned to zero for enabling updates for JRE. So if we were to come back into the control panel app, we can now see the update tab is completely gone. Right. There we go. Now, with regards to apps, just like any other application, so you're going to see all these in Software Center, you're going to have keywords, categories, icons, just a nice experience. So if you didn't have 7-Zip today, which we don't, you can see we don't currently have that, we'll go ahead and just kick that off in Software Center. Um, same log file here, so in Patch My PC script runner. Here in a second, we're going to see the 7-zip exe uh, kick off for the app. And you're also going to see things like command lines, exit codes for applications as well. So updates and apps are all monitored if you've been able to custom right-click options for updates. They all go into the same log file where you can see everything that's going on. There we go. So we can now see that it's done. Come back into add and move programs. If we refresh here, we're going to see 7-zip, and we're going to see Chrome and Java got updated. Now we've got 7-zip, Java 8221 in this scenario, and then Google Chrome 77, right? So that's all going to get reported back uh, using software updates, right? So state messages will come back here in a second. We should see that our patches are now compliant under our software update group. There we go. So we can now see Chrome's compliant. Java hasn't quite reported in yet. Um, but that's going to get reported just like any other Microsoft update. So what's cool about that? is any of the native reports that you may be using all report third-party patches the same way as Microsoft. So anything that you have configured kind of standard, you can see that within those native reports. Now, we also have some dashboards. Let me try to get there real quick. Uh, that you can have. So we got some that show third-party and Microsoft, third-party only, software update groups, collections, a lot of different filters. So these are actually free regardless of whether you're a customer. So these were originally created by Gary Simmons, who's a Microsoft uh, he was a support engineer and he had a blog post like how to uh, create software update group reports. So what we did, we added new support for some new operating systems as well as a installer that you can use to automatically upload these, change all the links to your SSRS server and all the reports to work just with like a, you know, an automated install. Um, so quite helpful, even if you're not using our product, you can come into the advanced tab, just click the report installer and there's only two options you need for your Big Manager folder name and your SQL reporting point. You can use that even if you don't use our product today. Um, so let's say we wanted to look at the workstation third-party uh, update compliance. We're 86% uh, compliant. That's going to break you into all the updates released that month and show you by default which ones are required on the most number of machines within that order. 
So for example, we can see the uh, visual C++ redistributable is required in six machines. If I click into that, depending on how deep you go, uh, you may go into a native report within ConfigMan where you can see uh, what are those six machines, for example. So you can get pretty detailed either at the device level or uh, the update level. Does the use of the software require an agent on the engine, on the endpoint? No. So no agents needed. Uh, everything that we're doing is either through the software updates. Well, everything that we're doing is through the Config Manager page. Okay. So software update scanning would be against your SUP. Applications would just be obviously native application deployment. So app discovery, uh, app enforce, all the same logs. You can also see what's going on there as well. Uh, cool, and then there's just a variety of different compliance reports that's pretty interactive and easy to use. But what's also neat, since uh, everything uses the same reporting, if you're using like any of the free Power BI stuff from Microsoft, or there's a lot of ones just within the community, like SC Config Manager has a lot of good ones. Uh, we can, for example, come in here in the off, uh, Update Compliance tab, and in addition to like all the Microsoft patches that you can see, uh, third-party patches show up there as well, right? So we can see within this lab, we have a bunch of Flash Player updates missing, uh, for example, we could use all the same filters, like let's look at critical severity levels. We can see that's going to take us down to some Firefox and Java updates in this lab, right? So anything that you're doing today is all going to work as well, the, the same way for third-party stuff. Um, questions? Yeah, so driver catalogs was the question. It's a fun question. Yes, sir. Um, so, what with regards to drivers, we don't support drivers. Um, there's a few reasons for that. Uh, we actually have an FAQ on it. We'll just quickly kind of look at that real quick. Um, the reason we don't do that is because they have uh, their own driver catalogs available today. And what's pretty cool, like I don't know if you guys have seen some of the new features in 1910. Let me just see if we can pull something up really quick to show you some of the stuff that's been improved. Um, so one of the big reasons why customers weren't publishing driver catalogs through the ConfigMan console is because there's no filter. Basically what would happen is it would publish every driver or every update within their catalog. So for Dell and HP, that could be four or 5,000 updates. Um, but one of the new features that came out in Config Manager 1910 is the ability to selectively choose updates within a catalog. So this is kind of internally at Microsoft. So we were working with the product group on this since like 1904, I think. Um, it was going to be 1906, but they had a bug. But just to show you what this is going to look like, like if you wanted to subscribe to our catalog in the console, you could potentially do that. You're not going to get as much flexibility like right-click options. You won't be able to create apps. So about 90% of our customers are using our tool rather than in console. But with regards to driver catalogs, What's kind of improving in 1910 that's going to make this feasible is this new catalog format that vendors like Dell, HP, Lenovo can provide where you can, when you go subscribe to it, if they're using this format, I'll show you what ours looks like. So we've been using this about eight months now. You're going to get a list of products and um, vendors. So for example, in a driver catalog, this could be something like a bunch of different models where instead of publishing 5,000 updates, you could be more selective on you want this model of driver, um, so as long as the, the, the vendors get on board with like categorizing their catalogs, um, we don't want to do that, right? So there's a lot of updates, there's a lot of testing we would have to do for hardware when there's already catalogs out there, especially with some of the new features that are now making it feasible to actually start using some of that. So we don't plan on doing it, but all the major ones have one. And once they bring on board this new format, it's going to make it really simple to automate and be more selective about what you're getting with your catalog. Cool. Uh, so quickly we'll go over pricing and then cover any other questions that you guys have. Um, so pricing is pretty simple. We basically have three tiers. For the most part, customers are either going to use the two or three dollar per year option per device. So usually enterprise or enterprise plus because that's going to be what supports all the automation. Basic would only support updates through SCUP using a legacy catalog without all the new filtering options. So that one's the one dollar. Um, most customers aren't using that. With regards to a comparison between Enterprise and Enterprise Plus, the, really the only key difference here is going to be applications. 
So if you want to have the application feature where you can create and update apps in SCCM directly, that requires Plus. With regards to kind of a feature comparison for uh, publishing using either the SCCM in console, which is kind of what I looked like, looked at with the new filtering options when we we're talking about the driver catalogs. This is kind of a comparison between those two scenarios. So for example, the real big differences there are going to be the right-click option. So you won't be able to turn off updates, add scripts. All of that's relevant to using our publishing tool, which we configured there. Same thing for the application. So obviously the apps will require our service to be able to create them. That's why the vast majority of our products are usually publishing with our tool. But you could use either or if you wanted to use the console directly. We certainly support that. Yeah. What is the uh, for product uh, catalog using? Which one does? Or is it just the basic? So if you wanted to use the per product, like in the console, you're saying? No, you have the, in the trial aspects, you have the, you know, the full trial for 30 days. Or the other one that keeps running. Oh, oh it's configurable. Like four so when you go and request a trial, you would be able to configure what feature level subscription you want. So if you wanted to see if Enterprise would work for you, you could start there. You could even start with basic. Um, and then depending on which one you select, your 30-day full trial is going to have the features of that subscription level that you request in this one. Uh, I'm talking about the, the other trial that you have. Okay, so like the one where you don't need to put... Uh, publish anything like this checkbox here. Yeah. Um, this will have basically Enterprise Plus. So you're going to get the updates capability as well as the apps. Okay. So, yeah, and I think that's also kind of mentioned here too. Like if you do the public checkbox, basically it's going to be the Enterprise Plus, which will allow you to create apps. So just for a limited set of products. Right? So that, the all the capabilities. Yep. So, I mean, if we came in here, you can see we've got all the same customizations we can apply. It's just to a limited set of products if you check that public trial mode. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, that is all I have. Um, I'll be around if you have like any more specifics. Come talk to me or Jock in the back, and we can definitely take anything. Maybe if it wasn't like a question for everybody. Cool. Thanks for having us. So, last session of uh, the user group meeting, um, we got Andrew Jimenez, uh, he's presented multiple times before. He was the lucky winner of a raffle that Patch My PC did. Um, I think that was just through Twitter or something. Yep. Um, so he got to go to MMS Jazz Edition. For those of you that have not been to an MMS or an MMS, I'll say XX. Oh, oh you are? Okay. <coughs> he's going to explain it, so I don't want to steal his thunder. But, uh, <laughs> You definitely, want, you, speech, you definitely want to go <laughs> presentation, you're already done. to one. Um, we also have another special guest who popped in, uh, Mr. Wally Mead. You guys all know Wally. And uh, he was there as well. So uh, he's going to come up and fill in some bits and pieces and stuff. But with that, uh, let's get started. Hey, guys. Um, I'm Andrew Jimenez. Um, and Hi, Andrew. Hi. I had bronchitis. <laughs> it was a good time. Um, so let's get started. Um, yeah, who am I? Um, I work at ASU down the street. Um, we support like 20,000 devices on our SCCM instance. There's six on campus, so it's a good time. <laughs> um, yeah, um, but the big thing about me was I won uh, a ticket from Patch My PC back there, so I wouldn't have been actually been able to do this today without Patch My PC. <laughs> um, so what is MMS? Um, so MMS is, is a conference dedicated to Microsoft management technologies. Uh, it was, I mean, it used to be basically SCCM, but now it's Intune and SCCM and MEM, um, Microsoft Endpoint Management, which is the future. Um, there's two conferences a year. There's MMS MOA, which is um, in, it's in the spring. It's, it's the larger conference. It has a lot more attendees. Um, I've never been to that one, so I'd like to win that ticket. <laughs> Justin? <laughs> uh, and then there's the traveling conference, which is smaller and shorter. Um, there's only been two, um, MMS Desert Edition here in Phoenix. Um, how many of you guys were able to go to that one? So that was my first uh, foray into um, the conference. 
um, and I had a really good time. And then MMS Jazz was also a great time. I've always wanted to go to New Orleans, um, mostly for the how uh, the buildings look and stuff. I really like the architecture. <laughs> you don't get to see anything like that over here. Um, everything brown. Um, so all the sessions have two speakers and an extended Q&A session, um, which is really nice. You really get to interact with the speakers a ton um, and get to absorb a, a way too much knowledge that should even be legal. Um, this year was at New Orleans at the Hotel Monteleone, um, which was a beautiful hotel. Um, there were beignets, um, lots of music, jazz. Um, everyone had really snazzy blue jackets, all the speakers you can see down there. Um, which um, you probably wouldn't wear outside of New Orleans. Um, <laughs> but people walking down the street in New Orleans see you with that blue jacket and you get um, And they got a lot of compliments. Um, and then I mentioned that they had beignets. So, so many beignets. I think I had beignets every day I was there. Um, and that's it. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> some background info on the conference. Um, at this one, there was a word of the day every day. Um, you weren't supposed to say the word of the day. And if and you started the day with one set of beads, and if you caught someone saying the word of the day, you could take the beads for the day. So if anyone, if I say any of the words of the day as we go through the rest of the presentation, feel free to call me out and you can have some beads. Um, the winner at the end of the day, ha um, who had the most beads, um, got a prize. I think it was a gift card for the restaurant at the hotel. Um, I don't have any prizes. <laughs> um, jam sessions. This is where Wally would come in if he would like to. Um, I can do a quick explanation and then if Wally wants to go deeper into it. I only went to one jam session, so um, I don't have like the depth that Wally does. Um, although I don't know if Wally just watched the food. If I what? If you just watched the food. No, no, no. <laughs> um, jam sessions are technical sessions with either the speakers or actual Microsoft employees that work on the product. Um, you can discuss problems you're having in your environment, bugs, improvements or ideas that you have um, for the future. You can actually get bugs in the product fixed in um, Config Manager, fixed, um, or make ideas to the, the team. Um, you can also, um, they're coordinated by Wally over there. Um, you could not sign up on the sketch for the jam sessions like you could with everything else. You had to find Wally, and Wally would get you a seat. Um, and he had bacon. <laughs> I ate a little bit. He ate, he ate uh, some of the bacon. Um, a lot of this presentation, I, 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 I didn't take as many pictures that I, as I probably should have. So I found Twitter posts for everything. Um, I don't have them all documented, but I'm going to have them all documented when I put the document up so that you guys can follow everyone who's, who um, might be interesting in this world. Um, so um, they actually had this giant poster on the wall of Wally. Um, so um, and then I have two examples of bugs that were actually fixed in the console, um, like during this during um, the conference. One of them is this is my favorite one I think right here. So you'll no longer get the 805 um, 000. You'll get the actual error description for why a software install failed. So it'll actually pull the text of the, why the ins install failed instead of the error number and nothing else. Yeah, it'll, it'll be in the next CP, and I assume the release after that. So, because this happened, what, a month ago? Yeah, like a month ago. So it, it'll be in the next CP, I'm sure. Um, but, and then the other one they fixed was they actually um, if you guys have done branch cache or peer cache, and if you haven't, you should. Um, when you go into the content uh, data sources, you can see how much data is being pulled from branch cache or peer cache. Um, before, I don't think it was sorted in any sort of fashion. I think it might have been sorted by amount of content like downloaded, but they've changed it, so now it's actually um, in alphabetical order for all your uh, boundary groups because it's impossible to find which boundary group you, you want to look at if you have 200 and it's sorted by size. <laughs> um, let's see. So yeah, um, go to jam sessions if they are available. It'll probably be called some, 
something else um, here at Desert Edition. They were cabana sessions out by the pool. Um, and I did one of those with the product team. I got um, a feature added um, last, last year. Yeah, Minneapolis was a the camping team. They were doing okay, the, sessions. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah that, it's really cool. Like, like Andrew said, um, uh, you, when you schedule one, you're with a product group. The devs are there. And you explain your problems, and then either file a bug right there for, on your behalf, or as you mentioned, you can sit there and you'll watch the devs actually coding your issue. They'll look it up in the code, they'll start coding it, and then in the last session of the conference, they'll show all the bugs that they fixed so far. Now, again, as you said, they go into TP, and then they'll go into product, uh, the release product, when they get embedded properly. But it's, it's very cool. People love those. Uh, and if you don't want to do a product group, let's say you have, you mentioned there's Extending Q&A is usually like 45 minutes where you can ask some questions. Let's say you have a private question where you want to talk about your domain name or something else that you want in everybody else's session in there. You can schedule one with any of the speakers and you get 20 minutes to go ahead and ask them specific questions about your environment or, you know, I feel like I didn't want to ask this because I feel like an idiot in front of everybody else, but here's my scenario, here's my problem. And you get personal time with them. There's always two speakers. Uh, so two speakers or the product group has anywhere from uh, four, three to seven people in there at a time of work on bugs. So uh, they're very cool 20-minute sessions in Minneapolis. They're 15, they extend them to 20 minutes. Uh, but as you said, we don't choose to schedule them on your own. You have to go through the meeting so that we don't have people double booking. They're all scheduled during your presentation time. So you have to leave a presentation and go to your jam session or camping session or band session, whatever, uh, and then head on back to your session when you're done. But, all the speakers speakers like that. So highly recommend to take advantage of them. If your personal time to vet your issues with the product group or suggestions and then um, ask speakers specific design and scenarios or problems or just things you don't understand. Definitely. Um, and like go to go go to at least one. If just even if you're you're reticent about trying, just go to one and you'll probably want to do more. <laughs> um, we had one guy wanted to schedule the five of them because they kept me in open slots. So the, the product group actually got tired of it. Oh, he's coming again? <laughs> so it's better to have more people in there. Oh, more oh, pro tip. If you go to one, make sure you get the bug ID that they put in. And then you can actually reference it to them. If not, then you don't know that it actually exists. They'll be like, sure, we'll totally get that as they're deleting it for you. All right. <laughs> Day zero. Um, so day zero was arrival. Um, they had a street party, which was really cool. Um, you can meet in a chat with all the attendees and speakers. Um, they have they had food. They had uh, drinks. Got drink tickets. So you could have some alcohol. <coughs> That's not my thing. So I had I had sodas. Uh, you can get stickers of Adam Gross's face. Um, all the a lot of the speakers had stickers this year, uh, which is really cool to collect all of them. Um, I went to bed early because I was dying. Um, the bronchitis and there was cigarette smoke and it was a bad it was a bad time for my day that evening. But I made it. I survived there. Uh, but the party was really good. Um, it was a good time to just meet everyone. Um, people that if you if you're on Twitter and you follow these people on Twitter, they're like they don't exist until you like really meet them and they're a real person then. <laughs> so it was really cool to meet all these uh, people that. Um, I've interacted before with before, but I've never actually seen them um, in real life. Um, day one, this was the first day of sessions. The word of the day was P-I-N-G. Um, so I'm going to go over like one session and then the big session at the end of the day, which is um, a really cool session done usually by the product team. Um, and that, the last session also involves alcohol. So, <laughs> um, so uh, the first one was the Config Manager service. Um, this was presented by Adam Gross, and I just know him as the WMI guy. Kim. Kim. Oh, Kim. Oh, Kim. Oh, Kim. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the admin service. How many of you guys have heard of the what the the admin service? Yeah. So it's basically it's an HTTPS interface to Config Manager. Um, they say it's going to replace WMI someday. Um, I'm skeptical, but it's the it's the beginnings of how you would get a web console. It's an API for Config Manager. Um, so you can, and because it's an API, you can start managing Config Manager over the internet. Um, 
big thing about that is once it's on the internet, you've opened a, a pretty big hole in your environment. So they discussed a lot of the security implications of this WMISER or this admin service and what you would want to do to secure it once you got it set up and open to the internet. Things like two-factor auth, um, wanting, ensuring that um, um, that the accounts that have access to it are limited um, and stuff like that. Um, scripting is going to be possible through this admin service, including um, things that are done through the, the normal PowerShell commands today. Um, and a lot of the functionality, I think, will end up, a lot of the functionality of the uh, PowerShell commandlets will be shifted into this admin service. Um, it makes, um, if you guys saw um, the presentations at Ignite and, and learned about um, Microsoft Endpoint Manager, where things are starting to actually come together, um, this makes that possible. It lets Intune and Config Manager talk to each other in the cloud. And it allows the co-management of your configuration manager devices on the internet because you've got access to Config Manager over the internet now. Um, I think a lot of the reporting stuff is also going to come from this connection. Um, at the end of the day, there was the Config Manager State of the Union. This, is, this was really cool because of Ignite had happened the week previous, week prior. Um, you get an inside, uh, an inside preview of the changes that are coming to Config Manager and Intune. Um, there, were, there were highlights of all the new reporting functions that you get. Um, a lot of stuff with desktop analytics is coming, where things will start connecting. Um, desktop analytics will start connecting everything together. Um, they showed a, they basically showed a history of the errors on a single device, um, both, both on-prem and off-prem um, in a timeline. And you could go and see what these errors were and click on the timeline and zoom in and see exactly what the history of a single device um, within this uh, new management console. Uh, so if you haven't heard, Intune and Config Manager, when they come together, it's Microsoft Endpoint Manager. Once you update to 1910, I believe your, SCC, your system center configuration manager becomes, um, what is it? MCM. MCM. Microsoft Endpoint. Microsoft yeah, but I don't think, I don't think the console says that yet. I think it says Microsoft Endpoint configuration. configuration Manager. So they don't have manager in there twice. <laughs> that was a whole argument um, on how it should be named. Um, um, DJM said he had a lot of meetings with lawyers. <laughs> um, so the, um, with the new name came the new licensing that you get if you have if you have um, Intune, you get Config Manager, and the other way around, I believe. Um, I think this um, really eased a lot of people into thinking into feeling that Config Manager isn't dead because it's not dead. It's going to evolve over time into this product. Um, so here's some highlights. In the past four years, they had, they've had 13 major production versions. Um, David uh, um, pointed out that they, using their previous release um, timeline, they would have had one. They'd be finalizing, they'd be finalizing um, SCCM like what, our, our 2019 now. So, we, so you'd be stuck with 2012 until now. Um, and they've had 13 different ones since since they changed to release multiple times a year. Um, and more than 71% of people are staying on the current release, so more people are upgrading even faster, which they were really happy about. Um, I wish I made these bigger now. Uh, oh, if anyone for, can get a hold of uh, someone from the PowerPoint team, I would really like a way to just embed tweets like you can do with websites. I want to just paste a link and have it be a, a fancy tweet so I don't have to screenshot everything. <laughs> um, so um, I really like this session because it showed where they were going and the, how they actually have a plan. Um, one of the things they mentioned, um, everyone always asks for a configuration manager console on the web. And um, David James's answer is always, that takes too long. It's like 300 engineering hours or some, or years, like 300 engineering years or something to make that happen. So it's like not happening, um, but it is happening. 
actually is happening now. But what they're doing is they're going through, um, they're going through and seeing um, use cases for each, um, like for like different personas. So they're building a persona for a help desk user right now, and they're going to build that into the web console, which will be the in the new mem console on I assume your like Azure Azure portal. Day two. The word of the day <laughs> is System Center Configuration Manager, but the abbreviation. Um, this was a good that one. Must have been a hard day. It was a hard day. <laughs> um, so this this is the day where you learn to say Configuration Manager a lot or Config Man. Um, I think that's when I got like all of these. Um, this was the day I actually did a. Um, a jam session too. Um, I did it with. I, I met with. Um, it was officially David Segura and Gary Block, but Donna Ryan was uh, chilling out there. Um, if you haven't looked up those people, they're all really awesome. Uh, Mike knows Gary quite personally. <laughs> um, I didn't have many questions for them, but I really wanted to meet with them and chat with them. So um, we talked about how the firewall team causes all our problems. Um, <laughs> Uh, we talked about how how Mike loves to reduce um, package sizes. <laughs> coming from so coming from a um, an educational environment where we have huge pipes everywhere, I just find it hilarious that Mike is so concerned about how how big everything is. And I'm like, I pushed MATLAB out like four times last semester. <laughs> Within a few weeks. Within a few weeks. <laughs> um, I also did. I also went to. Um, Config Manager is innocent, innocent um, troubleshooting software installations, and that night was tips, tips and tricks. So Config Manager is innocent was a great session. Um, I didn't take a picture of that, but there's Brian. I think that's that's a good approximation of how the presentation was. <laughs> <laughs> um, the word of, day, of the day was said a lot by the speakers. I caught them multiple times. Um, there was a lot of info on um, how to handle like um, packaging apps correctly. Uh, where you can figure out what's actually wrong with it. Stuff like using um, PS Exec to run something in system. I actually used that myself like yesterday, the day before. No, Friday because yesterday was the weekend. Um, um, they went over the different package types like the uh, MSI, EFC, how to use um, the features of the AppDeployed toolkit. If, you, if anyone's ever heard of that, um, it really helps you. I see it as a good way to standardize your packaging. Um, I don't use it personally, um, but I think it I think it helps if like you really want to make sure every single package has a standard um, input and output basically. Um, and then went over MSIX a bit on how, on its um, its improvements in on MSI and how much how it works um, to install software. Um, there's stuff about like the registry, like where to find. Um, how apps are installed, um, file system running things as 32 and 64 bit, um, stuff like that. I brought up a point about how MATLAB, the reason why I installed it like four times last semester was it won't finish its installation if you run it as a 64 bit app. The setup, the setup file will kill itself right before it finishes and, um, and completes. But if you run it as a 32 bit application deployment, it actually will finish. Um, something about Java and like the amount of memory it's given, it just crashes near the end. Java's never a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I beat my head over that for a long time until I found a Reddit thread on it, and so I made sure that it was known. Um, tips and tricks. I think this is one of my favorite sessions. Um, uh, and basically, they say anyone who wants to come up, come up and show um, a small tip or trick on something you know about, something that you could teach people. Um, they gave us four minutes to do our tip or trick. Um, we had, I want to say, 30 people go up. Um, they actually, it was actually well organized. They had a form this year, and you submitted the form before it would be like stand in line. Um, and they actually just called people up, and it was very well done this year. Um, so, um, I'm actually presenting right here. Um, my Wi-Fi died during the during mine, which and it required downloading 7-Zip. Um, um, I actually made a, a, I have a script that packages applications for me, 
not unlike Justin's uh, add-on, but I don't have 300 apps, nowhere near. <laughs> um, so that was a great, um, I think this is my favorite session of all of them. Um, I think, yeah. They also did a charity um, um, auction, basically. They had a few um, preset things, and then people, uh, some of the speakers started auctioning off their jackets, including um, Mr. Brian Mason, who decided to auction off his jacket. Um, he ended up buying his jacket from himself for $200, um, <laughs> because no one else would bid up higher than that. <laughs> so he's like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll auction this. And he tried to drive the price up and ended up with it himself. So. He purchased his own jacket, which was great. Um, Donna Ryan actually made these um, cross-stitch pie cross pieces, and those were actually auctioned off at a silent auction. Um, and I, did, I, I, I would have bought the, I would have bought this one before, um, but it was a bit rich for my blood by the time I got to the silent auction. Um, so that's always a great time. Um, hey, Andrew, you didn't mention the uh, the end of the tips and tricks, but happened. What they get? Oh yes! If you go to Tips and Tricks and you present, you enter a chance to win a laptop. And this year was quite a nice laptop. Um, it was a was it a Dell with a two terabyte solid state drive, 32 gigs of RAM. Um, yeah, it was a top end um, XPS 15, I believe. Um, and actually, Adam Cook here. Adam Cook here won one. Um, he was sitting right next to me. <laughs> um, it was a very nice laptop. Oh, i7, there we go. i7, 32 gigs, 2 terabytes, solid state drive. A real, a real dev machine. Um, uh, day three. The word of the day was... <laughs> The, the um, conference that had occurred the week before, where a bunch of big changes were made to this product. <laughs> um, I, I attended the OSD Builder session. If you guys, how many people have heard of OSD Builder? How many people use OSD Builder? And then uh, the Config Manager team Q&A. Uh, I don't have any write-ups on OSD Builder. You guys know what it is. Um, David Segura is a mad scientist. Um, Donna Ryan has built um, an app called Wimwitch, which is kind of a front end of OSD Builder, but not really. Um, it's her own product that you, that builds off of OSD Builder, um, and basically it's a GUI version to help you customize your Wims um, if the command line intimidates you. <laughs> um, so there, um, this was a really cool um, presentation where they went over how they worked at a deeper level, um, like how it gets the cat, how um, the catalogs are updated, how he keeps the app up to date, um, stuff like that. And then this is, I keep saying like this is my favorite, but I love all of the end of day presentations. Um, the Config Manager product team Q&A, um, it's really good. Basically, um, I mean, it, kind of speaks for itself. The product team stands up there, and you can harass them with questions. Um, and they'll tell you straight up answers on what you can expect. Um, OK. I actually have it here. Oops. Darn it. OK. Hold on. I want to actually open the Word file. They shared it. How fast did I flow through this? I'm actually doing pretty good on time. And um, I didn't type up all the answers, so I, I would love to know questions that you guys have, and I can try to and I can try to relay them. Um, but these are the kind of questions you can see you can get. Um, I of course asked about dark mode, um, and apparently the person who coded dark mode for the Config Manager console coded it and then went on sabbatical. <laughs> and then I think they moved buildings. Um, so stuff like this. See, here's my question. Um, so, I actually asked this one as well. Um, there was a security present uh, session earlier in the day where they basically hacked the config manager console, hacked into it, and got like admin on the 
config manager console from nothing multiple times. I didn't attend that one. I really wish I had. Um, but everyone was talking about it afterwards. And we, um, a bunch of the attendees and a, a bunch of the attendees were talking about how um, stuff like that isn't really visible in the console. Like you have these possible security holes in your console, um, stuff like not being up to date. Um, I think they used um, status filter rules to get in somehow and stuff like that. And so I asked if we could have instead of instead of the alerts that no one uses. Does anyone use alerts like on their deployments and stuff, like the alerts that show up when you open the console? I don't think anyone uses that. Why don't we have management insights up there and have some security focused management insights? Um, and uh, DJAM said yes. <laughs> um, people asked about adding like stuff like .NET so that you don't need OSD Builder. Um, I actually don't remember their answer about that, but I think they were like, I don't think they were really for it. <laughs> Um, they asked what the next role is besides the help desk role, and the product team basically came back and said, what do you guys want to see next? Um, and everything ends up basically being a config manager admin. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. Windows update for business. This was an interesting one. Um, I haven't looked, I hadn't looked in much into Windows update for business, but I had heard of it. But just people were asking about more options, like what um, can we deselect certain products? Like people are getting SQL Server patched even on Windows Update for Business, and most people don't want that to happen automatically. Um, and like whenever Windows Update runs, um, and the team came back and said they want to add features to Windows Update for Business, but they don't want to rebuild WSUS. They want to simplify it as best they can. Um, so if they add everyone's feature requests, they'll basically end up building WSUS again in the cloud. <laughs> um, so they really need to know, and they need feedback on what exactly is needed for patching. Um, let's see. Oh, this one's a fun one. What should be the company portal, or what should be the what should be the end user's software center? It, what, but Intune has company portal. Software. What about the Microsoft, the Windows Store? Software. You've got four, three or four different portals. And, yeah. and Store for business can be brought into software center. That is so. true. And well, it's going to probably end up being company portal. Um, but what they are going to work on is having the stuff in your software center um, showing those in the company portal. Uh, that's their first step. But they realize that there is a um, bit of confusion because there's like four company portals. Um, and it's hard to tell users which one is the one to use. If you're on co-management, you've got the company portal, the Microsoft Store, and the and software center. So where do I get my stuff? And that, that's an actually really, a really interesting problem that I hadn't thought about before. Uh, they asked this, will more products be added to um, Microsoft Endpoint Management, which is it's basically currently Intune and Config Manager, I think with maybe desktop analytics. Um, and they said no. <laughs> it's basically those products are is their management solution now. Um, and, they, and they worked really hard to make sure that they had the features they needed in this. And it's, um, they talked a lot about building a brand name. Um, and it, it's really difficult to build a brand name and then move stuff over. Like, I think someone asked about like Defender going into, or ATP going into this. And um, they basically put ATP into the Defender product instead of the management products. Someone asked to sort icons by default, like if the device is on that little icon that's <laughs> if it's online or offline. Um, I think they said they are going to do that. Um, <laughs> let's see, offsets for maintenance windows. They said they are working on this um, everywhere, because I think you can do it right now just in um, ADRs. I think you can say second Tuesday. You can do that right now. But you can't do it anywhere else. 
So things for like maintenance windows. Um, I think they're going to try to add it more places. This one was shot down. Remote control for chat sequence engine. They're like the like they, they're not in the remote control business. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, I asked about the community hub. It's coming soon. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot in the way of that. They have to. I think they have to be really careful. They're going to have for the community hub. They're going to have like three. Channels. They're going to have Microsoft approved, where the, everything's been vetted. They're going to have um, like a trusted publishers, um, or because it's all on GitHub. Everything in the Community Hub is basically in GitHub. They're going to have like trusted publishers, um, where it's people that like have been known and have been proven to be trustful, tr trustworthy. And then they're going to have like the danger zone, where you can plug anything in there and and import it into your console. They're also going to do um, everything from reports to task sequences, because um, right now I believe it's just scripts in the TP. They're gonna, they're, they want everything to be shareable in there. Um, this one's not on here, but I asked it at an earlier session, and I, I was really happy because I corrected DJAM. Uh, I asked about the future of um, IBCM, uh, Internet-Based Configuration Management. Does anyone have that implemented besides me? Uh, PKI basically. No, it's just me. Okay, maybe that's why they're not doing. It. They don't care about it anymore. Um, DJAM was like, we haven't updated that in years. Like, uh, user deployments that work on it, and I, I, I was like, uh, user deployments work since they moved the app catalog to the MP. He's like, oh, we fixed that inadvertently then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the future is CMG, um, but I'll hold on to IBCM as long as I can. <laughs> Um, those are the real pictures on. They need to have it sing the uh, Kenny Logan I hope song so. every time you click on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's see. Um, and they posted all this on the sketch. Um, one of the really nice things about MS is after it's over, you can go and download all the slides um, from all the presenters. Um, because there's a ton to take in. Uh, so move over takeaways. I'm doing actually pretty decent on time. Um, SCCM is dead. Oh, who said it? <laughs> but said Ignite first. is the new word. Hmm? Ignite's the latest new word. No, I, I was fine with Also, oh, all the words. Yeah, I mean, yeah. What were I don't all care. The words My kid loves these, and I'd like to keep them away from him, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, expect a lot more inter integration between Config Manager and Intune in the next few releases, especially. Um, a CMG is going to be really important for that kind of stuff. Otherwise, I don't know how you're going to get it up into the cloud. The CMG is, is the gateway for your config manager data to the cloud. Um, take advantage of the product team while you're there. Um, yell at them. Ask them about GIFs and Software Center. Um, <laughs> um, hey, look, that's a note. Um, I should have had a GIF there. Oh, well. The speakers are all super approachable. Don't be afraid to go up to a speaker and talk to them. That's why they're there. They're there to, to, to impart their knowledge on you. And feel free to correct them if you think they're absolutely wrong. Um, um, don't get bronchitis. Snack during the day. Eat snacks. I, was, I, was, I didn't eat snacks through the day, and they had them. I just never like took myself to the snack area to eat. I was starving because the last session started at five and ended at like seven, and I was I was dying at the end of the day. So eat, um, and if don't get bronchitis, and if you do, buy a ton of cough drops. Um, that helped me get through the like everything. Um, get social. Um, I had oh man, I want to say. Maybe three months prior, joined the Win Admin Slack. If anyone's heard about that, um, they moved to Discord recently because Slack is expensive, and they were like 
the free plan only lets you have so many messages, and it was so busy that messages just fell off too quickly, so they moved to Discord. Um, that's the link to it. Um, I'm, I, we had a, a private, basically, channel in there for MMS Jazz attendees. Um, and we like had discussions in there. We figured out like where to eat, um, stuff like that. There was like a, a, a group of eight of us, I want to say, that was a pretty. It felt like a like even like more tight knit community within the rest of the group. Um, and the um, it's been really awesome to like be part of, be like even be closer into the the community as a whole. Um, I don't know how many people of you are active on things like Twitter and Reddit, but like the community for Config Manager is like nothing I've ever seen. I don't think I've seen like a tighter knit group of people with stuff to share um, as much as us. Um, it's probably because we have really difficult jobs. Uh, I feel uh, Config Manager is super deep. And there's so much going on, and it's really, really, really hard to take advantage of, or like, know everything in it. Um, I'll open up for questions now. If anyone has any questions, if not, I'm not too far off, even though I did no timing at all for this. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the talk about company portal and the yeah. switch to that. But that was just in the Q&A. Wondering so. if there was any other software center related talks or. Yeah, I have like a network link to it to support link. But if we're moving away from that, then I don't know that it matters. But some of the question I always had was, what are you going to do with I, Software Center? Like, if it's missing something. I think Software Center is going to stick around for a while, um, unless they really figure out how to get everything in Software Center into Intune. Because they, they added like a company portal feature where you can like put a link to your you know, company portal or something. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you can put a URL. Just to solve service. So they, they totally, like, maybe that's a valid point that they, you can actually host the company portal within Software Center. I think that's very much a work in progress. Um, but I'd like to see more. I would definitely like to see more of that. Yeah. But, and, and they really harped on, like, you can add a bunch of maps in there. Hold on. My snow page. Where was it? They really harped on the State of the Union. Especially this, they're, they're adding features to Config Manager all the time. So features and improvements to Software Center aren't going to go away. Um, I just never voiced it. Maybe yeah. Um, how many, have you, do you guys know what the user voice is? Yeah. Um, put, your, put, put your opinions on the. I was you because you were like, if you have questions, you know. <laughs> uh, well, if you would have been at MMS Jazz Edition, the main dev yeah, at the jam session was the guy who coded software. Center. Oh. That's how they. If you saw on Twitter, the guy who was there, they were talking about like, can you can do something to like. Yeah, they, they, yeah. Where they added this feature. I'm gonna love that. Yeah. And I'll have I'll have links to all of these once I figure it out. That's why I need uh, PowerPoint to just like if I could paste a link and. <laughs> Still have PC text asking me what the hell that. Which one? The improved notes. Oh, well, right oh, now it'll they be. They still like, ask. Them. So what's that mean? I know, but it's better. It's not uninstalled the software. <laughs> at least it'll be like, at least it'll be like I can't find the software on the server instead of eight zero zero five. Yeah. Whatever the number is, I I know it by heart. But I don't. Sure. Uh, use the user voice. I literally put a user voice in last week, and it's planned. Um, they showed a lot of stuff on CM Pivot. Oh, that's one thing I should have mentioned. CM Pivot, they'll have in the MEM online console. So you'll be able to run CM Pivot on your co managed devices, both on prem and off prem at the same time, and get that data back. I think a lot of um, stuff that they're going to start doing is going to be around reporting. Um, so you see a lot in that space. Especially with desktop analytics, with which um, I have a Jira question. Yes, sir. <laughs> I need someone to click the button. <laughs> um, any other questions? Did you hear them say anything about HA for SCM? There was a question in the um, 
There was a question in the Q&A about HA. Um, someone asked if it could be active-active instead of active-passive, yeah. and they said yes. It's coming there. Oh, okay. um, so someday. Maybe the next one or two releases. I actually, so this is a really cool experience. I actually um, hitched a ride with um, Aaron. Um, I forget his last name. Chikowski. Chikowski. Um, the, the docs guy. Um, I, I hitched a taxi ride with him um, on the way back to the airport, and we had a really good conversation. Um, and um, I forgot where I started. HA. HA? <laughs> How did I get there from HA? I don't know. No, you tell me. Whatever. There's an H and an A in his last name. There you go, that's it. <laughs> anyway, uh, we talked about, um, he talked about how um, they go back to Microsoft and they have a meeting after these conferences and it really centers them about the product as a whole, about how like this isn't just like some piece of software, it's, it's a bunch of people's livelihoods and um, for some people it's more than their livelihoods, like it's, it's a big part of who they are. Like not just what they do, but like people like spend their free time in here. Like like uh, so I had a really good conversation with him about stuff like that and it's like the whole dev team is really awesome. It's really cool to be able to interact with the people that that build this massive gigantic piece of software that does a billion different things. You have more access to the product group the big event. They also announced the next year's traveling edition in San Diego yeah. in October, and the opening reception is going to be on the USS Midway aircraft carrier. Yeah. So it's a good time. Um, I would definitely try to go or, or win a ticket. Um, don't take my ticket. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a great time. I would definitely recommend it over just about anything else. I think, I think the only way you can get closer is to like have a one-on-one -on -one with the product team, which you can basically do here anyway, so maybe not even that. Um, definitely worth it. If there's no more questions, I'll, I'll you know, just throw up the slides. Oh, thank you, Patch My PC, for this, uh, sponsoring the user group and for um, and for my ticket. <laughs> um, thank you.